Chair, you have a live mic. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the commissioner meeting. Just as a little reminder, I want to ask you to please silence those cell phones. And uh, Commissioner McDaniel, is your mom watching this morning? You betcha. Miss McDaniel, you did well. He, he looks really nice today, so I just want to commend you on that. <laughs> but I, I have a few comments, Mrs. McDaniel, but I'll, I'll call you privately. I'll, I'll call you privately. I want, I want everybody to look at the camera and wave to mom. Mom! Hi, mom. Well, <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so what, uh, we got some proclamations to get started with and some agenda approvals. Let's get with it. Yes, sir. Let's start with our invocation, which is going to be led by Pastor Heath Jarvis from Faith Life Naples. And then we'll be following it with a pledge by Darlene Hedrick Izzo, a VFW Post 7722 Auxiliary Trustee Daughter of Vietnam Veteran. Great. Pastor Heath, if I could ask you, please, in your prayer this morning to add a little prayer for our Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo and her three girls. Yes, sir. Amen, amen, amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come before you today. We are thankful to live in one of the most beautiful places on earth here in Southwest Florida. Lord, I'm thankful that we live in a nation where we can come before you today and we can pray, we can invoke your wisdom freely without fear of reprisal from our government. Uh, Lord, I thank you that we can uh, invoke your wisdom uh, as we make decisions today that affect all who live here in Southwest Florida. What a privilege it is to live here. What, it, what a privilege it is to be in the greatest nation on earth. And Father, we do lift up Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo, Lord, and, uh, and her entire family. Uh, Lord, as, as they go through this transition, Lord, I, I know she lost her husband. Lord, I pray that you give them peace and that your peace guards their heart and guards their mind. But Lord, for today's meeting, I just ask that, that, uh, that as we discuss all of these issues that affect everyone who lives here, Lord, I pray that you give us uh, a peace and, and show us, Lord, how to uh, only make the decisions that you want us to make. Because your decisions, your guidance is the best. We thank you for that. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Commissioner's agenda changes for April 9th, 2024, Board of County Commissioner's meetings. Uh, first, we have move item 16H3 to 4C. This is a proclamation designating April 2024 as Autism Acceptance Month in Collier County to be accepted by Stephanie Norton, founder and president of Autism Collier, Inc. This move is made at Commissioner Hall and Commissioner McDaniel's separate requests. Move item 16K3 to 12A. This is a recommendation to approve and authorize the chair to execute a settlement agreement in the lawsuit styled Aaron Oldfield versus Collier County, now pending in the circuit court of the 20th Judicial Circuit in and for Collier County, Florida, for the sum of $130,000. This is being moved at Commissioner McDaniel's request. A couple of agenda notes. The companion listings for items 9A and 9B should reference each other rather than how they are currently listed. And the correct updated resolution for item 17C was uploaded as a linked file after the agenda was published on the afternoon of April 4th. This updated resolution can be found in a linked file named resolution-031524. Correct in prints. We have court reporter breaks scheduled for 10.30 and 2.50. And with that, county attorney. Uh, nothing more, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, changes and our ex parte on the uh, summary agenda or consent agenda. Commissioner McDaniel. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. I have no further changes and ex parte only on 17A. Commissioner LeCastro. Uh, no changes on 17A. I have emails and nothing on 17C and uh, nothing else. Just 17A emails. 
Mr. McDaniel, I mean, excuse me, Commissioner uh, Kowal. Uh, no changes, and I have no uh, ex parte's on the summary agenda. So, right. uh, Commissioner Saunders. And Mr. Chairman, I don't have any changes to the agenda. I did have some uh, telephone conversations in reference to uh, item 17A. Thank you. I have no changes and no ex parte on summary. We could get a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Item 2B is uh, approval of the meeting minutes for March 12th, 2024. I'll make a motion for approval. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 That brings us to item four proclamations. Item 4A is a proclamation designating April 14th through 19th, 2024 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week to be accepted by Sheriff Kevin Rambosk, Colonel Jim Bloom, Chief Greg Smith, Captain Chris Gonzalez, Manager Amy Tuff, and Dispatcher Gustavo Rodriguez Gonzalez, and Dispatcher Ketnis Pierre. I probably just killed her name. Congratulations. <laughs> Commissioners, while they take their seat, Michael Choate, your Executive Director of Public Safety. Sheriff, you've heard me say this many times. Um, Manager Tufts heard me say this. Chief Smith, heck, Captain Gonzalez, they've all heard me say this many times, but I'd love to say this publicly. As an end user of the system, when we push to talk, it's nice to have that comforting voice on the other end, somebody who's gathering the information, somebody who can remain calm and relay that information to us. We absolutely appreciate you, Sheriff, and your team, and the, the, the dynamics that takes place within that comm center just baffles my mind to walk in there. And if you've never been in there, Commissioner, you know it well, if you've never been in that comm center, I would encourage you to do so. And just stand back for one hour just watch what takes place. So thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, uh, Chairman, Board. Um, I'd like to thank you for recognizing uh, the members of our communication staff. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your support of law enforcement and public safety that built a state-of-the-art communication center for this community. Uh, it's what helps us get those emergency resources uh, to calls for service and as quickly as we're able to. You know, uh, telecommunicators, uh, really when you talk about first responders, are the first responders first responder because they intake the call, they provide information, they start to de-escalate, they provide emergency medical dispatch uh, that ultimately saves lives. So we have a terrific uh, group of members that are there. I will tell you, out of the thousands and thousands of 911 centers and communication centers across the country, uh, your center here in Collier County is only one of 138 nationally accredited for best practices and best standards throughout the country. So I'd like to recognize them for the fabulous job that they do each and every day in helping uh, protect not only our community, but supporting deputies, uh, firefighters, and EMS personnel en route to calls for service. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support. Oh. 
Item 4B is a proclamation designating April 2024 as National Child Abuse Prevention Month in Collier County to be accepted by Linda Goldfield, Chief Executive Officer for Youth Haven of Southwest Florida and other distinguished guests. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, County Commissioners, for raising awareness of child abuse in our community. One in four children in the United States are abused or neglected. On behalf of the children of Youth Haven, we have potentially 70 children that live on our campus. We've been providing services in this community for over 52 years. We're grateful for your support, the community's support. Together as a community, we make a difference in the children's lives in our community and ensure that they have better outcomes. And thank you for your support. Absolutely. Item 4C, formerly 16H3, is a proclamation designating April 2024 as Autism Acceptance Month in Collier County to be accepted by Stephanie Norden, founder and president of Autism Collier, Inc. Congratulations. you work your way into this group yeah. huh? come on wait a second do you guys know him <laughs> he, wanted a photo. He, he found the he found the button in the hall and he's <laughs> Hi, my name is Olivia. I have autism myself. I appreciate and thank the commissioners for the, clar the clarification of Autism Substance Month in Collier County. Having autism myself, I previously felt unheard and ignored by our local government, but this demonstrates a welcome shift towards awareness, and I hope and pray that more changes will be made for people on the spectrum. Mm. Good morning. This month we embark on a month of significance, Autism Acceptance Month. Can you state your name? Oh, sure. Um, my name's Stephanie Norton. I'm the president and founder of Autism Collier. And uh, we're gonna talk about Autism Acceptance Month. This is not just a time for awareness, but a period of action, reflection, and most importantly, understanding and embracing the beautiful diversity that autism brings into our lives. In the heart of every story of struggle, there is a lesson of profound acceptance. This truth became my guiding light through a journey that began with my two beautiful identical boys. Their unique view of the world opened my eyes to the true essence of acceptance. They teach me in their unique way that acceptance is not a choice, but it is a necessity for serenity. Acceptance isn't a journey to be ta undertaken alone. It is a community-wide mission requiring the hearts and hands of every one of us. 
From the early days of navigating through uncertainties and barriers, I've witnessed the transformative power of a community united in acceptance and love. It takes a village to raise a child, and for families like mine, this village extends to every corner of our world. For those who may not know, autism is also known as autism spectrum disorder. It is a complex neurological condition that involves persistent challenges in social interaction, speech, nonverbal communication, restrictive or repetitive behaviors. The effects of autism and the severity of the symptoms uh, vary greatly among individuals. So imagine it like a spectrum. On one end, you may have someone with uh, mild challenges. They can live independently. And on the end, other end of the spectrum, there is somebody who has uh, more profound um, challenges and they need more support. One way to think about autism is to imagine the processing centers of our brain, our computer system, and they're wired differently than what's typically expected. This can make social interactions, communication, adapting to changes, challenging for someone with autism. However, with supports and therapies tailored to their needs, many people with autism can lead fulfilling lives, contributing uniquely to their communities. Autism Acceptance Month marks a shift from mere awareness to a celebration of belonging, equal opportunities, and the invaluable contributions of indiv individuals with autism. There are 5.4 million adults with autism and one in 36 children in the United States. So if we broke that down to Collier County, we have about 60,000 kids here, and that would mean that 1,900 of them live here today with autism. As the founder of Autism Collier and mom to two boys on the spectrum, I've seen the shift in dialogue surrounding autism from a narrative focused on a cure to one that celebrates acceptance and understanding. And acceptance is indeed an action, a commitment to change, not just in our language, but in our perspectives and interactions with people with autism. Our journey doesn't end with acceptance. It's merely the beginning. It's a call to action for each of us to contribute to building a world where individuals, regardless of their differences, find the rightful place and purpose. We must move beyond acceptance to representation, celebration, and ultimately liberation. Today, as we embrace Autism Acceptance Month, let's renew our commitment not to just speak about acceptance, but to embody it in our actions, policies, and community engagements. Together, we can pave a way for a future where every member of the autism community is valued, understood, and celebrated. Thank you, Collier County. In particular, thank you, uh, Commissioner Saunders, for helping champion this. Together, we will create a world of understanding and opportunities for all. Let us be the change that we wish to see. Let's embrace this month not just with awareness, but with a heart full of action and change. Thank you for being here and for listening to me and joining Autism Collier on this significant journey. Together, we can make a lasting difference, ensuring a future where everyone has access to happiness, growth, and independence. Thanks. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask Stephanie a question. Hey, I, you may. <laughs> I may be putting you on the spot, and I apologize for that. I probably should have said something beforehand. Okay, that's better than yeah. scripts. <laughs> well, we, you and I had a conversation several weeks ago about some problems in the county and city parks in terms of facilities and that sort of thing. And I thought maybe you've got everybody's ear uh, this morning. Maybe if you could spend a couple minutes uh, telling us what we can do to help you with some of the issues that you're dealing with, especially as it relates to, to our park system. Oh, my goodness. Okay, sure. Um, thank this you. Is, this is not scripted. I just thought... No, it, it sure scripted. isn't. So I, um, again, I'm, 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 I'm putting you on the spot, but I think and this I'm is really a And I'm really appreciative of that. So we have, like I said, we've got about 1,900 kids in our county um, on the spectrum, and many of them need additional support. So... Our camps in our area, I believe we have one in the Golden Gate Community Center and River Park Community Center with the city of Naples. Between 1,900 kids, there's not a lot of options for summer school, after school programs. There isn't after school after elementary. Um, and we are looking for community-wide engagement. It would take all of us to, to sit together and uh, work on how we could create these opportunities for these families um, so that it, they can go to summer camp. So 
thank you. I just wanted the commission to hear that uh, we may need to take a look at some of the things we do in our summer camps obviously not uh, I do have ideas but that's in a pile of research at home so I'd love to sit and talk with you all about ways that we can make our camps more inclusive well that was my purpose was opening the door for yes. that thank so, you sir so take, take advantage of that can and I, I think everybody's question? listening I will sure, Stephanie, we're gonna... Stephanie don't go away yes yes Commissioner McDaniel good morning good morning have you uh, had any experience with Goodwill's Pathways? Yes. Okay. Yes, I know Jessica Dursey. One of my suggestions might be, because we already have a relationship with Goodwill, is maybe engaging with them with the Pathways program that we have at Goodwill that is an amazing program that helps folks. Um, I, I might suggest that maybe our staff reach out and have a discussion with Goodwill about engaging there to assist with the parks program and the summer camp program. That's one of the things that Pathways, in fact, does is is uh, is assist with the, both the families and the folks that are that are on the spectrum to be able to to live a, a more normalized life. So, thanks. I, Great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. So, thanks, Gail. Um, well, one of the things I missed there when I was talking about summer camps is uh, right now the parents have to pay for personal care support. And I am uh, fortunate enough that my children receive the home and community based uh, waiver, which is, is quite a process. There's about a 10 year wait list so that we can have personal care supports in our. In, to, to go with, with my boys, but the average family here doesn't. Um, and the cost th of that over the course of nine weeks in a summer is about 25,000 in addition to your regular camp fees to bring somebody with your child to camp to be a one-on-one -on -one support. So that's really where we need to troubleshoot how we're going to work that out. Thanks, Gail. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, All right see you next week. Thank you. Go ahead, Olivia. Commissioners, I just want to say one thing. Um, what your Steph Stephanie and Orden was talking about the summer camps. The other thing that adults with autism struggle with too is housing and financial support. We don't have the support. We have to always ask our parents or someone to always help us. The housing is horrendous. Um, getting a job, we can only make a certain amount. So if we make over that, we'll lose our income. And we really need the help people on the spectrum find a better way to like financially help us that's a great thing for pathways to, to talk about thank you thank you Olivia. thank you commissioners if we get a motion to accept the proclamations uh, so moved mr. chairman second moved and seconded all in favor say aye aye Commissioners, that brings us to item 5A, Artist of the Month. If I can direct your attention to the back of the room. The t April Artist of the Month showcases the talented winners of the 2025 Keep Call Your Beautiful Calendar Art Contest. For 26 years, Keep Call Your Beautiful has diligently organized this art contest with invaluable support from Collier County's Solid Waste Division. Collier County students from the 1st through 12th grades are annually encouraged to submit original artwork that emphasizes recycling, proper disposal, and the students' passion for the environment. Many of these talented students also participate in Keep Collier Beautiful's annual community-wide cleanups, including the Great American Cleanup on April 20th and the International Coastal Cleanup on September 21st, 2024. With that, that brings us to item seven, public comments on general topics, not on the current or future agenda. Troy. Mr. Chairman, we have six registered speakers this morning. Your first speaker is Lori Harris. She'll be followed by Darlene Santos. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. I'm here again. <laughs> so, uh, Lori Harris, Marco Island, Florida, and I thank you again for your time. As expected, the Collier County Domestic Animal Services Advisory Board has reselected their chosen candidate for the at-large seat. The process was confusing. Despite checking the recording several times, I don't know how the votes were counted. Uh, I have applied for the at-large seat because of my drive to serve this community and use my eight years of volunteer insider experience to suggest improvements. 
The chairman questioned me appearing in front of you to advocate for my candidacy as being divisive, while my number one goal is to bring all parties together as one team. And this I'm quoting. The Animal Services Advisory Board is a seven-member board that was created on January 27, 2004 by Ordinance Number 2004-06 to make recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners on program services classes, special events that will further assist Kelly County domestic animal services by providing the best possible service to the community. Since the advisory board is not presented to the Board of County Commissioners in five years that I know of, as required by this ordinance, it is not a functioning board. The chairman also reduced meetings from 12 per year to four per year. Commissioner Saunders was gracious enough to come to the February meeting and let the advisory board know that they're in the budget process now to come to us with your budget needs for next year. Collier County, uh, Patterson also gracious enough to come to the April 1st meeting with a similar message. Public Works Department, uh, Tanya Williams, gracious enough to come with the understanding of the urgency to get workshops going to get this budget done for the advisory board. It took advisory board member Officer Rago to point out that workshops need to be scheduled sooner rather than later, since the next advisory board meeting isn't until July. I checked the website as of this morning, still no workshops have been scheduled, and unless the chairman schedules an a regular board meeting in May, the July meeting will be too late for the process. I point this out to you since a non-functioning board will continue to have the problems escalate to Ms. Williams, Mr. Rodriguez, or Ms. Patterson, and I am certain they would appreciate a functioning board. I spent almost 20 years in corporate HR. This experience has taught me to be highly organized, collaborative, uh, collaborate effectively, and recognize the need to plan well ahead of time. I ask you to choose the applicant who is most qualified for the position. If you do not believe that is me, no problem. I will support the, uh, the, current, the board that is put in place to the best of my ability to support them in their mission. Respectfully submitted. Thanks, Ms. Harris. Your next speaker is Darlene Santos. She'll be followed by Eva Front. Good morning, commissioners. And I'm Darlene Santos, and I'm pleased to be here. This is new for me, appearing, meeting all of you, appearing before the board. I'm a resident of Collier County for 15 years, and I am also a foster volunteer at Humane Society Naples for eight years. And um, I just feel strongly about giving back to this beautiful community with my heart devoted to the vulnerable, voiceless animals of Collier County. I'm here today in support of Lori Harris, who has applied for the open seat at large on the Domestic Animal Services Board. Ms. Harris has been volunteering for um, the past consecutive eight years. And I've met her in this room. I don't know her, but I just attended a few meetings and she spoke. and. I, I liked what she had to say in her dedication. It's my understanding that none of the other candidates have been involved in our local shelter in such a manner for that length of time. I've witnessed her commitment and drive to improve animal outcomes to better serve the Collier County community. In addition, I'd like to draw attention to uh, some of her experience and background, community services, um, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Staff Officer, Coxswain Instructor, DAS Volunteer Sense 2016, Guardians of Florida Animal Rescue Adoption Coordinator 2021, and also Marco Island Patriots and a Church Volunteer. Her education is St. John's University, Bachelor's in Science, 1987. Uh, positions held 20 years in human resources and corporate business administration. Positions at Merrill Lynch and the Dun and Bradstreet Corp. Completing her career as Vice President, Employee Benefits and Stock Programs at Nielsen Media Research in 2003. And more information is on her application. On a personal note, I've attended several DAS advisory board meetings and believe bringing in fresh ideas, perspectives, and enthusiasm will greatly benefit the residents and the vulnerable animal population in Collier County. I follow DAS for some time now and would like to get more involved. 
having noted a uh, little public participation at the last four meetings that I've attended. I close with commissioners, you have exemplified great courage and spearheaded many changes in Collier County. I remain hopeful that when choosing your selection, you will once again use your extensive expertise and select the most qualified candidate while at the same time keeping the doors open for new members and growth. I thank you, um, Darlene Santos, a voice for the voiceless. Your next speaker is Eva Front. She'll be followed by Garrett FX Byrant. Morning. Good morning, Commissioner. So I have a short clip from the um, last DAS domestic annual services for us all to understand and maybe hope for a constructive feedback at the end of my speech, if you wouldn't mind. Um, sure. It's a minute, uh, short. maybe. Thank you. Yes, very short. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning. My name is Eva Front, and I am a full-time Collier County resident. I'm honored to speak today in front of you in support of Ms. Laurie Harris' candidacy for Domestic Animal Services Advisory Board. Please allow me to use this opportunity to express my gratitude and appreciation for our county management, Ms. Patterson and Mr. Rodriguez, for listening and acting on public concerns, Ms. Perry, DAS Director, patiently responding to my calls and emails, explaining the reasoning behind certain processes. And also to you, county commissioners, for swiftly approving last year an increase of DAS spending for up to $850,000 for outsourcing veterinary services uh, when that action was desperately needed. Laurie Harris graduated St. John's University. Over the last eight years, she has served our community as DAS volunteer. She also volunteers at Guardians of Florida Animal Rescue, Marco Island Patriots, and Presbyterian Church. Working within such a variety of organizations shows she is incredibly adaptable and can han handle any task that comes her way. With over 20 years of experience in human resources, I am confident that she will be able to use her interpersonal skills in uniting local rescues under one mission to help our community become a better place and by doing so, help you achieve the goal of making Collier County number one place to live in and play in the United States. Commissioners, you have attended such a large number of board meetings at the highest level. Please allow me to take you for a few seconds to the recent DAS advisory board meeting, hoping you will be able to give all parties involved constructive feedback and Mr. Miller, if we could start at the sure, forty-seven minute like to mark. Here on the board. We allowed to discuss the candidates amongst us, or no? I, I don't see why not. You would you rather do that? Yeah, I mean, I oh, just okay. I just um, I just want us to think about moving forward before we vote. We talked a little bit last time about, um, you know, maybe changing. And I know I'm staying on, so this is probably the last person that should say this. Um, but my position is appointed that there is some benefits in sometimes rotating new faces and new perspectives onto the board. So that's just something that I want people to consider and to make sure that this board is a reflection of our community. I would agree with you. And I remember you you pointing the fact that I've been on this board a long time and maybe it was time. Having said that, I think I probably bring more to this board than most most of you. Okay, I, I, I spend hours and hours and hours on things uh, I don't know if anyone else brought these things or realized that we didn't have the paperwork that we should have had, so, so do that. So you've been on this board for two years now? Okay, and I respect you being here, and I like you being on the board, but I don't recall a lot of things you've brought to the board in your last two years, and you're one of our newest members. But you are correct. Some, sometimes new blood does help. That was the clip. Right. It, it kind Thank of you. went on with, you know, another uh, member... And it's just that whole process of voting for the existing member was kind of confusing. You're welcome to um, to look at that clip. It's kind of, it goes on a little bit more. Thank you, Ms. Bryant. Thank you so much. <laughs> Your next speaker is Garrett FX Byrent. He'll be followed by Richard Schroeder. For the record, Garrett FX Byrent. This is a public service announcement for everybody. You got 
less than a week to file your income tax returns. And the federal government, oddly enough, I took the short form because my total income is, is under the poverty level. I make less than $30,000 a year for the last 25 years. But it was interesting because I go to the library because uh, all my sources of everything is our great library system we have. And they had laid out all of the forms you can get, the paper forms, because I'm computer illiterate for the most part. Uh, and long and short was I picked the shortest form at the end, right? Because <laughs> uh, it says for adult seniors filing by themselves and filled it all out. And I sent it in about two weeks ago. I figured I'm not going to be late ever, even though all of my accountants are dead for the last half a century. I'm definitely going to be on time. Well, four days ago, this is true, I got a bill from the Treasury Department for $1,215. Now, how they have ever translated that paperwork that fast, I was like, man, these guys really are after the poor people, even the poor people that are battling on other avenues. But it's interesting that that now, according, because I called up the Treasury Department, and they said, well, this all started off the record, they said, when uh, apparently Joe Biden came up with the idea, well, I'm going to go after Donald Trump and bring him to his knees. I'm going to go after all his money and everything. I'm going to do all that bad stuff you can legally do. But the Treasury Department actually works independently of all political people. And unfortunately, Joe Biden was not aware of all the bad stuff his own son did, probably worse or at least equivalent to Donald Trump. So uh, if unless you guys want to all get the same uh, in my boat, which you don't want to be, make sure that you file all of your tax returns before the 15th of April. So thank you for letting me share that with you. Your next speaker is Richard Schroeder. He'll be followed by Katie Tardiff. Thank you. Um, uh, Richard Schroeder, retired physician. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just continuing a discussion I started a couple of meetings ago about the uh, medical risks of wireless radiation and how it affects our community specifically. And today I want to just focus on smart meters, okay, that we all have, many of us have on our homes anyway. Um, the entire electrical distribution uh, system in the U.S. and in many countries is being converted into something called a smart grid to distribute electricity more efficiently and for other reasons probably as well. Everyone's electric meter is now digitized and continuously records information about our electric usage and then automatically broadcasts that information back to the electric company every few seconds or minutes, uh, day in and day out, uh, in one of three ways. Either one, with microwave antennas, number two, uh, over the power lines themselves, or number three, uh, via fiber optic cable. Uh, actually, none of these methods are safe. Uh, microwave technology is used for the smart meters in most communities, and I presume ours, and communicates between all sorts of gadgets within the, within the home to broadcast towers on utility poles that then rebroadcast these little data packets back to the utility company, sometimes as often as 10,000 times a day, and in some cases as often as 132 times per second. So as a consumer, you're exposed to radiation from three sources. Number one, the smart meter. Number two, the relay tower in your neighborhood. And actually number three, the electric wiring in your home. So this actually makes, uh, you know, it ends up making smart meters uh, more dangerous to your health than cell phones from the standpoint of radiation you receive from, uh, from these devices. So smart meters can cause harm even when they do not exceed the FCC's exposure limits. Recall that the FCC's exposure limits have no validity, actually, because these limits protect only against gross heating by high levels of radiation. I mean, that, that's not even what you're getting with, with, uh, with these short wave uh, pulsatile radiation from smart meters and, and phones. They do not protect against direct damage to the heart, nervous system, and other organs that uh, can occur with extremely low non-thermal levels of radiation. So why am I reminding you of all this, even though smart meters and the buying in to the federally mandated so-called smart grid is mostly a done deal in this community, and people sometimes don't care anyway as much for their health as they do for uh, conveniences and routines. 
Well, remember that I said last time that smart technology, smart meaning secret military armaments for residential technology, was developed uh, by the military as a dual use technology and is strongly suspected of being used as an incendiary weapon against non-combatant citizens. Um, and so I will continue this the next time with where I'm going with this, but it does, it does represent something of significance to the future of this community, I do believe. So we'll talk to you soon. Your final speaker under item seven is Katie Tardiff. Hi, thank you. Thank you, commissioners, um, for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, what I'm addressing today is uh, something that we learned recently in Lely Resort, which is that uh, there's talk of a Costco, a big box Costco coming in. Yeah, I know. Um, it's all talk for now. Um, but f when, as it develops, uh, I also want to say we're big fans of Costco. We love shopping at Costco. We have no trouble driving the distance to go to Costco that already exists in Naples. And our feeling is that we don't, we're not looking for box stores and box and, and more uh, retail, especially in a corner that's already clustered with two gas stations, one of them be also being huge. Um, but the challenge is uh, best use of land and the process for the, the approval process for a, a project like the Costco um, uh, uh, and multi-store complex going in. And so um, we're, we know that it hasn't launched, but we do know that it's in the thinking process and we very much hope there'll be a lot more um, said by the commissioners about that project. Um, the people that I talk to are not, love Costco, not in favor. And it's not this not in my backyard thing. It is, we don't need more of that kind of development. We already have it. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your ears and listening. Bye-bye. That was our final speaker for item seven. Commissioners, that brings us to item nine. Uh, item 9A and item, I, item 9B are companion items. They have both been continued from the March 12th, 2024 BCC meeting. It, they will both require ex parte disclosure to be provided and for all participants to be sworn in by the court reporter. Item 9A is a recommendation to approve a rezoning ordinance for the NBC RV mixed use planned unit development, a portion of which remains in the rural fringe mixed use district receiving lands zoning overlay to allow up to 356,000 square feet of commercial and industrial uses and 75 travel trailer recreational vehicle campground units on property located 450 plus minus feet northeast of the intersection of Basic Drive and Tamiami Trail East, five miles east of Collier Boulevard in Section 18, Township 51 <coughs> South, Range 27 East, Collier County, Florida, consisting of 34 plus minus acres and by providing an effective date. It's companion item 9B is a recommendation to approve an ordinance amending the future land use element and future land use map and map series of the growth management plan to create the East Tamiami Trail mixed use subdistrict to allow up to 356,000 square feet of gross floor area of com heavy commercial and industrial uses and up to 75 travel trailer recreational vehicle campground units. The subject property is located 450 plus minus feet northeast of the intersection of Basic Drive and Tamiami Trail East, five miles east of Collier Boulevard in Section 18, Township 51 South, Range 27 East, Collier County, Florida, consisting of 33.523 plus minus acres. Uh, first, uh, ex parte from the commissioners, please. Ex parte, Commissioner McDaniel. Uh, yes, I've had meetings and emails. Mr. LeCastro. Meetings and emails as well. Mr. Kowal. Uh, meetings and emails also. Mr. Saunders. I've had meetings, uh, emails, and calls. Well, aren't you special? Aren't you special? <laughs> and I've had meetings and emails as well. All right. Uh, we now need all participants to be s to stand up and be sworn in by the court reporter, please. I do. With that, Mr. Davies. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Good morning, Commissioners. Noel Davies with the law firm of Davies Duke 
here on behalf of the applicant this morning. We were last in front of you on March 12th. There we go. Uh, and since then, we're uh, happy to present some additional changes that we've worked through and, and worked on with your staff. We have some additional aerials, some additional exhibits to share with you. My client representative, Keith Basic, is here today. Keith and his family have been in Collier County since the 1970s. Bob Mulhair and Ellen Summers with Bowman are our professional planners. Norm Trebilcock is our transportation engineer. You're all familiar with the project site. It's approximately 33 and a half acres. We're five miles east of the intersection of Collier Boulevard and the East Trail. And our pending applications include a rezone to PUD and corresponding GMPA. We're proposing approximately 356,000 square feet of commercial and industrial, as well as 75 travel, trailer, recreational vehicle spaces. Regarding the discussion last time with respect to the crushing use at the northwest corner of the property, you'll recall we had agreed to a 40-foot height limitation for the stockpiling. Uh, we've since been able to reduce that to 30 feet, and we've added that specific language to the PUD document, which your staff has reviewed and accepted. Uh, there was also discussion regarding a five-year evaluation. We are agreeable to making that an annual evaluation. Uh, here is a line of sight exhibit that we prepared with respect to our neighbors to the east, all of which are zoned agricultural. None of the neighbors have objections to this project. Our client has agreed, as you know, to a, a 10 foot high concrete wall, as well as a 20 foot tall landscape buffer. And there is at least 300 feet of separation, sometimes much more than 300 feet between the portion of the site allocated to the crushing use and the residences to the east. As I mentioned last time, this is the appropriate location within the county for this type of project, and your staff agrees there are existing industrial uses all along the western perimeter of the subject property. Here are photos of the two concrete batch plants uh, that sit immediately adjacent to our west. These are both approximately 50 feet in height, uh, and there is a height limitation for stockpiling of 50 feet as compared to our 30 foot limitation. We have had two neighborhood information meetings with respect to this project. We've worked closely with our neighbors uh, throughout the process, including on all of the conditions, uh, which again include the 10 foot wall, the 20 foot landscaping, the specific siting and separation. And we're also committing to that annual review and the 30 foot height limit, as well as state-of-the-art technology and, and water spray systems. Uh, because of the, the thoroughness of all these conditions, there have been no public speakers uh, opposing this project. And as you know, your staff is recommending approval, and we respectfully request your vote of approval today. Thank you very much, commissioners. I'm here to answer your questions. I'll go first. Mr. McDaniel. Um, <clears throat> and this may be, uh, um, we have another item coming up today uh, ha dealing with uh, staff's interpretation of PUDs being inclusive in the live local. And I would like to know, and this is new, I just, uh, this, I, I didn't, when, when we met, I think we met last week, um, I, I didn't give consideration to staff's interpretation for the conversion of the commercial and industrial over to high density. And I would like to know if your client would be uh, agreeable to adding language to the PUD to prohibit that automatic conversion under the lib local. So to prohibit the ability to yeah. without amending the, the PUD with, without amending the PUD. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just I did, um, in the event that at some stage there is interpretation that comes across. We have we have yet to set policy. We won't do that until later on today. Uh, and then that discussion will ensue as to whether or not the board, in fact, sets that policy. Um, but I, I would like to I would like to ask if that would be agreeable for your client. No objection for my client. I mean, would like to look at the specific language, but um, I think I understand the intent and the concept, Commissioner. And my client doesn't have a an objection to that. Okay, and 
Do you want to make the motion for approval? Well, I, I, I was going to make a motion, but I just wanted to go on the record saying I've spent a bit of time talking with Mr. Davies and his client. You know, I seem to have all the rock crushing lots in my district, but, you know, putting them on Santa Barbara and Davis isn't the same as putting it um, in this location. And maybe no location's perfect, but there's certainly a lot of imperfect locations. This one's not imperfect. Um, it, uh, it, it, it puts it where it needs to be. And what we also need to, people need to realize is there, there's, a, there's a purpose for these type of um, operations. So citizens that just say they shouldn't be anywhere, well, then all this stuff lines up in our landfill and then people hate that. You know, that's the you know, same folks that say we're not doing anything for affordable housing. And then the second we build affordable housing, they say, well, oh, but I didn't mean there. Um, so there's a purpose for this. Um, I like the changes that you've made. Um, I also like that we're dealing with, it is important to me when we're dealing with um, uh, an applicant, a legal firm that we have a rapport with. So even when it says every year in here, I have no no uh, um, worries that if uh, you know Miss Cook or Miss French or you know the, our our county team went by that location and didn't see something that they that they didn't like that we'd be able to get you on speed dial and that's not the same you know there's there's some builders that have come here and have half built something and abandoned it and we, we couldn't track them down even just for a quick question so you know when I look at all things. Um, uh, concerned here and the changes that you've made. I mean, I'd make a motion to, to approve it. I don't have um, any kind of significant issues. I know that we'll monitor it. I just say that we've talked about significant things when it comes to making sure that you don't make the same mistakes that the last rock crushing lot, lot made. And, and granted, it's a, it's a little bit of apples to chairs because it's, a, it's in totally different locations. But, you know, the quantity of what goes in there needs to be, the crushing needs to be kept up. There's a lot of lessons we learned from the last lot. This is out in, in an area where um, I'm not surprised we haven't gotten citizen pushback or, or anything because it's not in the middle of a huge community. Um, so I don't, I don't really have any reservations. Um, if my other um, colleagues have uh, comments, then I'll, I'll, I'll wait off on the, on the motion because they might have some issues or whatnot. But well, I'll, I'll just say I'll make a motion to approve, um, but I'll preface that by saying if there's any comments that my colleagues have, um, you know, please chime in. But I'll just put the motion to approve on the books. Mr. McDaniel. Well, and if I'll second the motion, if the motion maker will include the language of the uh, the for the uh, absolutely, conversion. absolutely, and I'll second the motion. All right, motion made as amended with the language and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, that brings us to item 11A. This is a recommendation to have the Board of County Commissioners review and approve staff's administrative application process for projects intending to utilize the allowances per Florida Statute 125. Point zero one zero five five parens seven parens a the live local act. Mr. Mike Bosey, your director of planning and zoning, is here to present. Thank you, County Manager Mike Bosey, uh, planning and zoning director. Um, we're here to talk about the administrative application of the live local. Um, that staff has put together. We've I've spoken to you a couple of times in terms of the the densities we've identified, uh, um, some of the processes we have. But this is a for, I wanted to, to formally present it to, to the board of county kind of commissioners. Get your your feedback in terms of how staff is interpreted and get direction from you in terms of how to move forward related to uh, the Live Local Act. And one of the I think the, the primary questions, and it was already raised by Commissioner McDaniel, um, is the question of will PUDs be eligible for the, for, for, for the live local application? Um, the statute says a county must, uh, must authorize multifamily and mixed use residential as allowable uses in areas zoned for commercial, industrial, or mixed use if at least 40% of the residential units are in the proposed multifamily rental development uh, for a period of 30 years are affordable as defined by the Florida Statute 420. Staff has interpreted that zone for commercial, industrial, and mixed use to include your C1 to C5, your travel trailer and recreational vehicle, industrial, business parks, 
And then the following uh, plan unit development zoning, the commercial PUDs, industrial PUDs, commercial or industrial tracks within mixed use uh, PUDs. The example I utilize is uh, NC squared is a mixed use PUD, um, but it allows for a commercial area and allows for a residential area. Staff's interpretation would be that that commercial area would be eligible, the residential area would not be eligible. Um, so that's really the largest question that we are asking. A, a couple other applications I'll get through, but the, the feedback we're looking for is related to are PUDs eligible? Um, I believe the, the county attorney has opined that we would be that, that, that we would be within uh, um, our allowance to make that decision that PUDs were somewhat a, 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 of an exception. Um, Corbett Giblin, your housing and economic development manager, provided or director director provided me uh, with a 43, uh, um, a 43 page PowerPoint that was recently put on at the end of March. Um, Tampa, Sarasota, Pinellas counties all participated. And one of the things that they focused upon, and, and I'll get to that for a second. So, very the beginning of this presentation, the question, because it's not just unique to, to Collier County, the question was, are plan unit developments eligible for Live Local Act? And the answer that they provided is, it depends. It says, consult your city or county attorneys. There's no clear guidance on this question. An um, example, Hillsborough County has stated that PUDs are eligible where places like Orange County have stated PUDs are not eligible. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Klatska, I don't want to speak for him, but he, I believe he has made the, his, his conclusion was PUDs were somewhat unique and they, are at, they, they, they would not be eligible for the Live Local Act. Um, they provided the, the, the arguments for P, PUD eligibility. The Texas statutes mandate applies in any area zone for commercial, industrial, and mixed use. The arguments against the PUD being eligible, eligible are PDs are a type of negotiated contract and can't be unilaterally amended by the, the Florida legislator. And it cites an um, article of the Florida Constitution, no bill or attain or ex post facto law or law impairing the obligations of contract shall be passed. Um, so those are some of the legal arguments that suggest why you can or you can't uh, uh, um, exclude or include PUDs as eligible for live local. Ultimately, I think the Florida court system is going to provide for the final arbitration of, of, this, uh, of this question. Um, but staff is seeking direction from the Board of County Commissioners related to the eligibilities of PUD. One of the things that I would also connect that decision to, I've cited the 91.77 units an acre that's allowed within the mini triangle. That's a, that's a PUD. If you would say that PUDs would not be eligible for live local, the density that's associated with, live, with PUDs, I think would also be excluded from that calculation. Um, so it will change what the, the, the highest density that we've identified within our growth management plan that's, that, that would be allowed. Um, so there is an interconnectivity to uh, um, the, 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 the decision of excluding PUDs that would, if w that decision is made, we would exclude the, the mini triangle, which provides that 91.77, and we'd fall back upon the future, uh, the, the, the density rating system within the, within the growth management plan, which has a maximum cap of 25 units, 25 units an acre. Um, so with that, I mean, that's one of the, uh, the, the first uh, questions for, for your deliberation. Thank you, Mr. Bozzi. Mr. McDaniel. Yes, and Mr. Chair, I mean, this is, uh, this is one agenda item with a lot of questions and a lot of policy decisions that we need to make, and I'd like to make a suggestion that we vote on each one of these, 7A, B, C, D, and E, all the way through, and then the interpretation on the ZBLs independent of one another so we can have discourse and discussion, if that's okay, rather than... In, because there may be a, there may be a 
place in here where we cross, and I, I don't want to fail the whole thing because I don't agree with staff's interpretation. So, with that, I'd like to I'd like to make the suggestion that we. Uh, um, That's I, a good suggestion. Okay, and I I I would like to say um, to you. Um, I, do, I don't concur with staff's opinion that PUD should be included in the live local bill. I, I, my interpretation is, that, and for very simplistic definitions, hard zone properties, commercial, industrial, mixed use, that sort of thing. Um, I, I don't think that we should. I believe, I believe every PUD stands in and of itself for what it is and how it is and is negotiated with regard to the impacts of that, and I, it would be my preference that we not uh, include PUDs, MPUDs, CPD, IP, pick all those extra things that are included in there, and we only stay with the, the hard zone. Okay. Commissioner Saunders. I agree with you, Commissioner McDaniel. I think that there may be some issues here, and this may be one of them, where we ask the Attorney General for an opinion uh, because we're, this is the kind of thing that there's likely to be litigation somewhere. Uh, and, you know, it seems to me that the argument is that a PUD ordinance is simply an ordinance. I, I understand the contract issue, but it's still a zoning ordinance. And so I think there's legal arguments on both sides of whether it's uh, included in Live Local or not. Uh, we can make our decision, but our decision isn't really binding on anybody. And, and you know, if, if there's a lawsuit, associated with it if we're wrong. So just a thought, uh, Mr. Klatskow, the AG are there some issues pined. here where an attorney general opinion may be helpful? Your the attorney general has already pined that this does not apply to putts. Okay, well then that's, that's oh, even though that's not uh, necessarily the last say on it, but certainly is. Of course. It's just advisory. advisory. Attorney general, uh, I would agree with you there. Well, I'll make a motion on the, on the you want to you want to do it on per motion or per per item, Mr. Chair? How do you want to do this? I mean, we can take a look at these. Like seven A is obvious. That's what it says. It's really not what it's we're talking about. But I, I uh, let me hear from Commissioner Kowal first, then I'll oh, answer that. Forgive me. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> and I I, I kind of agree with my two colleagues here. Also, um, I feel that you know th this was brought up. Tallahassee knew about it. They passed this the session before this past session, and they had a second bite at this apple this session, and it didn't seem like they cared or had any appetite to even really give clarity on the PUD subject. And, and the way I look at it is that, like with our county attorney stated, that I think um, in a way they didn't didn't give clarity to it because they under, understood that, you know, due to, due to the, the, ed, the Constitution and the way it's written in the, in the one argument that was made in that uh, process that, you know, they are threading on grounds of uh, violating an already arbitrary uh, agreement amongst people. So, you know, this is how I feel. And I never liked to live local from the beginning because I think it takes the power away from the local government to make decisions for their citizens at the citizens level where it affects them and not the 66 other counties in Tallahassee that's now forcing our hand because they don't live here. So, you know, Collier's unique. You know, we know we, you know, our whole county at one point was just agriculture and we we're gonna go case by case depending on what we need or what we don't need. And I feel that we should still have that power. So, thank you. So, uh, my comments are along the same lines. Um, I think to include PUDs in the Live Local Act would be cutting our nose off to spot our face. Uh, the, the statute plainly says what's zone C1, C3, C5, or the industrial and all that stuff. It does not even mention the PUDs. And um, the Live Local Act, pr the preemption of it all still sticks in my craw. And I think this is a way that we can make it more commonsensical for Collier County, as Commissioner Kowal said. And it's, um, you know, we plan these mixed-use PUDs with residential elements and commercial elements in them. The commercial elements are there to service those residents within the PUD and the surrounding area, eliminating traffic, eliminating uh, trip, trip links, 
And so it makes uh, good sense as far as growth management planning and as far as long-range planning to keep that intact. And to strip that, I feel like it would just, um, it wouldn't be prudent. So we can take a look and approve, you know, 7A. How many are, have we got? I don't see the, how many of these? There, there will be a four, four, uh, four right. additional. Let's questions. take a look. So I'll make a motion to approve 7A as it reads, not including the PUDs. Mm -hmm. Second. Mr. Chair, before the vote, we do have a public comment. Okay. Yes. Uh, Rich Yovanovich. I'm not sure what area. I didn't know we were bifurcating this, so. No problem. Uh, good morning, for the record, Rich Yovanovich. Uh, I realize I only have three minutes, and, and actually I know what your decision's already made, so uh, I won't need the whole three minutes to talk about the applicability to PUDs. Uh, you know, I just fundamentally disagree with your interpretation of the statute, which is fine, but what I really would like to know is what's the AGO number, where the AGO is actually given an opinion on that, because I was going to recommend you get an AGO opinion. I was also going to recommend, since... And, and, and the timing for what I'm about to say is probably not the best timing in light of the fact that, you know, John Pasadomo just passed away. But the author of the Live Local Act is our own uh, Senate President Pasadomo. So perhaps why don't we just, when, when things calm down, we ask her, did this intend to apply to PUDs or did it not intend to apply to PUDs? I've heard two different interpretations, Commissioner Kowal, of why did the legislature not do anything? And the interpretation I heard was it was obvious that it applies to PUDs and the way it was written. So we did not need to clarify whether it had applied to PUDs or not. I think this is a difficult uh, issue. I think we should take some time. I'd like to see the AGO. I'd like to be able to read it. It's news to me that there's an AGO out there. Uh, but I think if we could just take a few weeks um, maybe ask Senator Pasadomo or her office to weigh in and say what was intended by the Live Local Act. Because candidly, the language is crystal clear. It says it applies to any area zoned commercial, industrial, or mixed use. It doesn't say except for PUDs that include commercial, industrial, or mixed use designations. I think it clearly does apply to those areas. And candidly, that's against my pecuniary interest. Because I would make some money coming through the PUD amendment process to now change those uses to uh, a residential use. But the legislature was there for a very important purpose to address affordable housing. I know it sticks in every one of your cross that this was a preemption. Um, and I understand the legal argument about contract zoning, and that's what a PUD is. But you all change PUDs frequently because you adopt the land development code, and you never say it doesn't apply to then existing PUDs. You don't do that. So perhaps we should look at whether or not any of these changes you've made actually do apply to then existing PUDs because it's a contract and you don't have the unilateral right to amend that contract. I think what the legislature did was clear. Um, most of the local government lawyers I've spoken to agreed it applies to PDs or PUDs. Uh, you can take a different approach, but I think we have some local knowledge and there is no rush to come up with an answer to this. And I think you should ask local rep representatives what the legislation intended to do. And then I'll, I'll wait for Mr. Clasco to give me the AGO number. I'll go read it. And that's what I was going to ask you to do is get an, get an AGO opinion anyway uh, today. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Ivanovich. I, we have, we have, for, I have a question for the county attorney. So if we decide not to include PUDs in the Live Local Act the way we interpret it, we, do we have the right to take it on as a case-by-case -case basis if somebody wants to put an application in and make that decision instead of just carte blanche? You have two approaches. Uh, the traditional approach would they be asking for a rezone, and then we go through that normal process. Um, we could go off on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, but then you're – you're sort of looking at uh, people claiming that it's an arbitrary decision. So as I'm, as I'm thinking about this, probably the best result would be to say, just put in a rezone application and be done with it and uh, do it that way because we have a clear process for that. Okay, thank you. 
I do have one more public speaker, Daniel Zagarek. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, in, in terms of live local, I agree with uh, Mr. Ivanovich that it should be slowed down a little bit. Maybe talk to some of our uh, legislators. Um, ideally, I think discussions should be had uh, asking how it affects the residents of Collier County. You know, I think, I think Live Local has some issues now. I, I think Live Local doesn't get along with everything that we do and everything that our, uh, that our residents expect. So uh, I know I'm being real vague. Maybe, you know, maybe I should tell you I don't know how uh, Live Local and our good buddy Bert Harris are doing, hmm. you know. And, and once we do get opinions and, and information from our uh, state legislature, I, I, would, I would recommend that you sit down and think about that because they've got issues with, with laws that they've passed. So please regard what I'm asking you. Thank you. Commissioner Saunders. Uh, thank you. A couple, couple questions for Mr. Klatskow. Uh, I think I agree with you when you said if we try to do this on a case-by-case -case basis, then we're, we're somewhat being arbitrary. I mean, either PUDs are included or they're not. Uh, we can't say, well, this PUD is included, but we're going to make the decision that this one isn't. So I think we have to be consistent with how we deal with, the, with it. We can't, I don't think this arbitrary picking one here and there uh, would, would work. Um, uh, Mr. Klatsky, I don't know if you were able to pull up on your computer there, the AGO, uh, if you, that, I saw you, it looked like you were looking for something there. At that yeah, I sent it to you, actually. Oh, okay. Can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about it, this just, because that may give some clarity to this. Uh, I could send it to Troy and we could throw it on the overhead if you'd like. Yeah. We don't need it. If you, I, and I have no issues with waiting for a couple weeks for us to digest what, what that AGO says, and, and but basically, like the AG, know. basically the AGO is saying it's for straight zoning. That was the intent. Which is what we're doing. I'll, send, I'll, I'll forward you the email. Commissioner McDaniel. Uh, I, I, I um, you know, having the AGO is, is good. I mean, we, we all have, expressed our thought processes with regard to the Live Local Act. Um, and it's been shared with us by staff that it's this board's policy decision that will include or not include these other defined zoning. And I, I stick to the, the original statement that I made at the beginning that uh, my interpretation is similar to what the county attorney has said, what, the, what my understanding of the AGO is, and that is hard zoning, period, and MPOs are not included in that thought process. So it would, I, I don't have any, I mean, at some stage it'll be litigated. Somebody will, somebody will sue along those lines if, in fact, they feel they have the right, and then we'll, we'll amend accordingly. I don't, and Commissioner Saunders, just for clarification, I don't think it would be arbitrary for us picking, we're not picking one MPO over another, or, or MPO, a PUD over another. We're not picking one over another. If, if an applicant wishes to amend a PUD, they have a, they have a, we have a process for that amendment. If they, if they ask, ask for a rezone, we have a process for the rezone. And we can take those into consideration based upon the circumstances where those individual properties are located. So I, I, I haven't, I mean, with all due respect to, to, to our friends that have spoke here today, I, I, I have, we've been dealing with this Live Local Act for a year and a half now, expressed our concerns when it first arrived in Tallahassee. And um, I, I think this is an appropriate uh, suggestion by this board to set this policy now give specific definition because we're we're going to move into multiple things on this agenda item here today that this decision will have impacts all the way across the board all the way to the last 
the last one on today's agenda or on this item, and that's uh, the the Z the the uh, um, ZBLs. So I'm, I'm going to second the motion. I made the motion before you took it. I'll give it to you, Mr. Chair, and I'll second your motion. So the motion is made in the second to not include the PUDs as part of the zoning. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, moving to 7B. Thank you. Uh, 7B, a county may not restrict the density of a proposed development authorized under this subsection below the highest allowed density on any unincorporated land in the county where residential development is allowed with the decision to exclude PUDs from the live local that would exclude the, the mini triangle. Therefore, the highest density that we would allow by our, by our density rating system would be 25 units an acre. I'll move for approval on that one. Second. Uh, move for approval and second that um, the PUD would not be included in this. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? 7C, a county may not restrict the height of a proposed development authorized under this subsection below the highest currently allowed height for a commercial or residential development located in its jurisdiction within one mile of the proposed development or three stories, whichever is higher. And the nuance here would be the height that would be allowed within PUDs would be excluded from that search area. It would only be the it would only be the straight zoning that would provide for that that height. I'll move for approval of that one as well. I'll second it. With the with the with the exclusion of PUDs and all those other staff interpreted additions, yes. Move for the height restriction is straight zoning. All all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? D, a proposed development authorized under this subsection must be administratively approved and no further action by the Board of County Commissioners is required if the development satisfies the county's land development regulations for multifamily developments in areas zoned for such use and is otherwise consistent with the comp plan with the exception of the provisions establishing densities, height, and land use. Such land development regulations included, but are not limited to regulations related to setback, landscaping, water management, parking requirements. And the way staff's applying that, that's the development standards that these projects would have to, to satisfy. We've identified the, the residential multifamily 16 zoning district as the highest uh, density uh, multifamily that we allow by within, within our LDC. Um, and they, it has to be uh, satisfied. An example, the front, uh, the front rear setbacks for the project would have to be 50% the height of the building, but not less than 30 feet. The side yards, 50% of the building, but not less than 15 feet. Um, and then every other development standard that's within our land development code related to, 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 to landscaping, to open space, to parking, um, all, all the components of the LDC would apply, but it's the standards of the RMF 16 uh, multifamily uh, uh, zoning district that we would will utilize to evaluate uh, these future projects. Mr. McDaniel. Yeah, and I just had a question for clarification, uh, Mr. Bozy. Um, you know, very specifically, 50% of the height, 50% of the height, but not less than 30. Does the does an applicant that comes in to that can't meet the 50% of the height request a variance or a deviation on their application or does that administratively happen oh that doesn't administratively happen that would be a variance would be a public hearings uh, in those that would probably invalidate the whole local process if you're going through a public hearing process it goes to the hearing examiner okay and so if a deviation is requested How does that conflict with the with the with the public hearing process on the Live Local Act? That's my question. If we if we adhere if you're up if I, I say yours because you're the you're the boss of planning and zoning, and so if your interpretation is to apply the RMF 16 development standards to a Live Local proposal, and then that proposal comes in and doesn't meet those standards, then how do you overcome the 
the deviation or uh, variance process? It, the, the Live Local is clear. It says it has to satisfy every single one of your standards within your land development code with the exception of height, uh, with the, the exception of, of height, density, um, and the third was land use. Okay, so, so my question to you, mm -hmm. and forgive me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Terry gets mad when I do that. My question is, would it be helpful for you if we eliminated the, the second portion, because it's very clear, 50% of the building height is for your front yard setback, and fifty and then uh, uh, um, side yard is 50% of the building height. Um, that's an easy parameter to meet, but the others would require a deviation, and that puts, a, I think, would put us in conflict. Would it not help you, help us, if we specified that for uh, for the live local act application, 50% of the building height for front and side yard setbacks, period, the end. Um, I mean, you could make that decision. It doesn't, really, it, it doesn't really have a bearing upon whether a project would need to seek a variance. There could, there could be some development standards that they're having a hard time with in terms of maybe it's open space, maybe, it's, maybe it is a setback, maybe... So, and we allow for that process. The land development code allows for that process. Um, so I don't see, I don't see any real conflicts or roadblocks by uh, allowing for a project to, to seek a deviation if they can't sa satisfy all of the standards within the LDC within that RMS uh, 16 zoning district. So the preclude, for my understanding, and maybe I'm just confused. The the uh, a request for a live local act has to meet all of the standards and if they can't meet the standards of the 50 percent building height they have to ask for a deviation and that precludes them from uh, applicability under the live, the live local act because they're automatically thrown by our land development code into a public hearing process correct so i'll move for approval of 7d as it's written second thank you for your indulgence i apologize no that makes it clear so we have a motion and a second all in favor say aye aye, aye. all opposed done 7e a county must consider reducing parking requirements for a proposed development authorized under this subsection if the development is located within one half mile of a transit stop as defined in the county's land development code and the major transit stop is accessible from the development um, staff's interpretation the only form of mass transit available is the cat system a review of the definitions in the county's LDC doesn't yield a clear definition of what a major transit stop is. We don't de define a major transit stop. We've interpreted that constitutes a bus stop on a cat route that either has a covered bench or is at the intersection of two or major bus routes. Uh, alternatively, the applicant always has the right to apply for an administrative parking reduction, which would provide the justification for the reduction. In either case, the county must consider the request um, but it's not author. It's not required to 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 approve the request. It's just we have to consider it. Um, so we are we're, we're asking for. And I did speak with Commissioner McDaniel. He uh, about our lack of definition of what a, ma a major transit stop was. And I think well, that's one of the things that uh, we were going to ask the board to opine: is a ma a major transit stop more than just a, a bus stop with a covered bench is it is it one of the the transfer stations that we have uh, um, that we have a, a, at at the government center at Radio in Davis uh, I believe is, is another one of the locations where the transfer stations uh, uh, um, are, are, are located so l looking for a, a tighter definition of what the board would consider as a major transit stop Mr. Castro. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the quest, the more of the concern I had wasn't what the definition of a transit stop was, but I just thought it was a little bit ambiguous when it said the county must consider reducing parking requirements. So that gives us a latitude to decide we're going to reduce it by two spots, three thousand spots. It doesn't matter. You know, I just I thought there'd be a little bit more specificity in there. Maybe not a not a math equation, but it, it just leaves it open uh, case by case. Correct. I mean, that's Correct. the best ver verbiage. Okay. I mean, that, that was the only sort of question or concern I had. It just seemed a little bit thin. Um, 
I think I, I think I know a little bit more of what a transit stop is than than I do what a reduction in parking could should be. And every case is different, so maybe it's 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 a little vague to give us the latitude is what I expect. But you know, when I first read it without any kind of interpretation, that's the thing that jumped out at me. I don't know if anybody else had any questions or concern, concerns about that. Mr. McDaniel. Yeah, and not to, not to go backwards, but we'll go backwards. Let's, let's deal with the parking issue since you brought that up. I do have an opinion on the uh, or a thought on the bus stops as well, but uh, I, I I believe candidly our our parking requisites for multifamily are are um, deficient as they currently sit. I brought that up during the Ecos project. Uh, did some further explanation or exploration during that time and. Just for for my brain, and I'm pulling I'm pulling from memory here, so forgive me, but if I'm not mistaken. Our current LDC requires one and a half parking spaces per one bedroom. Correct. Uh, uh, correct. And then an additional parking space for 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 or a half a parking space. I believe space. it's a half a space yeah. and go to another bedroom. So. My, 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 my oversimplified state, and, and it, go, it goes right along those lines. I mean, uh, a one-bedroom apartment can accommodate a couple. In our times, in our community, a couple means two cars, not a car and a half, and a half for a guest. Um, so I, I, I would really rather we, I would rather we eliminate the APR process at all just to just because that's an administrative approval that's being applied even on um, at market units where uh, APRs are coming in and being asked for. We've got parking deficits throughout this community in a lot of different developments throughout our community. So um, I, 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 my, the the APR process the uh, that and that's the uh, administrative parking reduction. Um, I I would rather see it not be applied here. From the and, and now I have and then I have a comment on the bus stops as well. And a covered bus stop certainly does not equate in my brain to a major transit stop. We have, per my knowledge, we have three major transit stops the one here on the complex radio road and in Immokalee and I believe that those should be defined as our major transit spot stops and we may add others that could be included at some stage I know there are some plans for another uh, transfer station um, in between radio road and Immokalee now um, but for now I would suggest that those be the definition of a major transit stop only. Mr. So, Saunders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on, on the issue of whether we have adequate parking requirements, I think that's a, a, an issue for another day. We do need to take a look at that. I wouldn't disagree with you. But on the covered benches, our policy is we're trying to cover all, this, all the benches. Um, <laughs> and every year we have a couple that we want to cover because it's a matter of funding, I think, more than anything else. So. This would really open up, uh, I think, almost every transit stop. Right. Uh, so I agree that that designating the major ones individually makes makes sense uh, as we as we develop them. And and you know you're correct on the uh, parking. Let's. How about if I bring an agenda item forward where we review that actual code in our LDC at a separate date? We don't have to address it now, but the definition for. A major transit stop is, as I stated earlier, without repeating it. So I'll move for that to be the, the, the answer here. And, and uh, I would second that at, at this point. We can always add to that list of, of course, major transit stop. Uh, just as a thought, the whole end game here is to get affordable housing built in the county. And I love the decisions that we've made so far as far as not including the height and the density requirements. However, on the parking thing, is it government's responsibility to determine a developer's parking prerogative? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Per the LDC. Because I think, I think uh, if we did, it says the county must consider reducing parking requirements. So if we were allowing ourselves to consider it, ultimately the risk of burden is on the developer if there's inadequate parking. 
if there's a bus stop and it's not covered and there's people that are using it majorly, I mean, the, the developer can say, at my expense, I'll make this transit stop a major transit stop to get the parking reduced. Yeah, I mean, just keeping with the language of the statute, one approach would be for the board to direct staff to come back with an actual definition and then a process as to the waiver, which I would recommend it be the board's waiver. For parking? Yes. Yes. We're, 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 and, and I think Commissioner Saunders and I already agreed we didn't really need to address the parking today. We're, you're reading from staff's opinion here in the last sentence, and uh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can deal with the parking at, on a separate agenda item, sir. Sure, no, I just wanted to throw my thoughts out there. Yeah. I'm not completely opposed to it, but I just, I thought if I was a developer and I wanted to put some affordable housing in and I needed to do something with parking, I would want it to be considered instead of just squashed. So, Commissioner Kowal. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I don't want to keep beating a dead horse, but I kind of agree here with the, the language in, in the statute itself with the major transit spot. You know, once again, we learned how important a comma is. So mm -hmm. there was a comma between major and transit spot. I would think that they're talking major and transit spots or vice versa. But I think it's definitely identifying that a major transit spot. So I don't, once again, I don't want to start changing definitions of words that, you know, that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, you know, I kind of agree that I don't think a, a bench covered, uncovered, or, or whatever you can consider a major transit spot. You know, in, in my in my opinion, and I think the language is clear. So, thank you. All right. So we have a motion and a second to not go with this. No, to de well to define the major transit stop as I defined before. For repeating sake, it's there's three: one on site, one at Radio Road, one on campus. And but then what about the and then Immokalee? All right, and what about the reducing parking requirements? The reducing parking requirements are, are going to come up at a later date. They still have the right to come in and ask for, uh, an, uh, based upon their own individual circumstances, a parking reduction. But I'll, we'll deal with the uh, overall parking at a later date. And, and the way this will work, Mr. Chairman, the way I read it is, uh, if there is a, a major uh, uh, transit stop, as we define it, and there's a project that is within some distance of that major transit stop, we must consider reducing parking requirements, whatever they are. So Correct. you're in favor of the way it reads? No. Okay, Correct. I just, that's what I, I as, don't, as and we, we have the I latitude. I didn't know how to vote. As we defined, um, I don't mean to talk over you, but as we defined major transit stop being those three, and if it's within a half a mile of those three, we must give consideration to a parking reduction. I'm with you. So we have a motion and a second to approve it as it states. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Good. And that actually ends the, 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 the policy decisions. This, that, this last question was about if you had a, a mixed-use PUD and the commercial was developed, would you subtract the density associated? PUDs are off the table. So this question's mute. So all the feedback staff was looking for in the policy guidance uh, has, I think, been established by the Board of County Commissioners. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Yes, before you go away, in regard to ZVLs, I would make a recommendation from a policy standpoint that the county attorney's office be included in every single one of those just to, just to ensure that staff's interpretation of the code meets statute, meets our LDC, meets our GMP, and so we have an extra set of eyes. And under the guidance of uh, uh, um, County Attorney Klatskow, we are providing uh, the the, uh, the County Attorney's Office a copy, a review of the ZVLs uh, as we're issuing them now. Before they go out? Before they go out. Okay, good. All right, with that, let's take a court reporter break, and let's come back at uh, 1045.
I didn't have a live mic. Cherry, you have a live mic? <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, with your indulgence, we're going to jump to 13A um, since we have all of those folks in the house here. Sure. Uh, 13A is a presentation of the annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ended September 30th, 2023, an authorization to file the related State of Florida annual local government financial report with the P Department of Financial Services. Mr. Derek Johnson, Clerk of Courts Office, Director of Finance and Accounting, is here to begin the presentation. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Commissioners. Derek Johnson from the Finance Department. We're here today to present to you the 2023 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report and the results of the fiscal year 2023 financial audit. This process requires the cooperation of all county departments and the county's constitutional officers. In particular, I'd like to thank my staff, county administration, the county attorney's office, and staff throughout the county and constitutional offices. This process starts in the middle of summer with interim audit procedures and culminates with the presentation before you today. We are proud to report that last year's 2022 annual report was the recipient of the GFOA's annual financial reporting award. Well, that was the 37th consecutive year. I'd also like to plug our popular annual financial report, which is a, a bit more condensed and a much more readable version of what's before you today. And uh, thank you with that. Uh, with me are Mr. Kessler and Ms. Mitchell. Uh, they're from the firm of Clifton Larson Allen, Clifton Larson Allen, the county's financial auditor. And uh, we just have a short presentation to put before you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. It's right here. All right. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, I am pleased to. Um, present the results of the 2023 Financial Statement and Compliance Audit. Uh, again, I'm Chris Kessler, Principal with CLA. Uh, joining me is the manager on the engagement, Alexandra Mitchell, um, who handled a lot of the day-to-day -day field work with the team and worked with your staff here within the county and the constitutional officers. So I want to go through just briefly the services that we've performed and give a quick synopsis of the results of our procedures. So as a quick overview, our, our services that we are performing as it relates to the audit have not changed from prior years. So there's three main components of the services that we are providing. It is the audit of your financial statements for the year ended September 30, 2023, and that audit is in accordance with government auditing standards as is required. Uh, we also audit the federal compliance, which is known as the single audit. The federal guidelines are known as the uniform guidance that the county has to follow and we have to follow in performing our audit procedures. And then, of course, we also have to audit the state compliance, and that is for the state grants and various other components of compliance that the county has to comply with throughout the year. So the reports that we've delivered are in the large financial statement, the annual comprehensive financial report that you all have in front of you. Again, these six deliverables have not changed from prior years, but these are the reports. And included within those reports are our audit opinion on the financial statements, our report on internal controls, which is where any sort of findings and internal control over financial reporting would be included, our independent auditor's report on compliance, that is our opinion on compliance with federal and state regulations, our independent auditor's report on compliance for specific Florida uh, compliance criteria, as well as a management letter as required by the Auditor General. Um, the governance communication letter is a letter that is issued to you all as the board. We're required to communicate under standards. I'm going to cover um, what I'll consider the key areas of that letter to you all uh, in the presentation here today. So the results of our procedures, we had an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. That means the financial statements are free of material misstatement. There are no issues within those numbers within that document based off our audit procedures. Our independent auditor's report on internal control had no findings in internal control over financial reporting. Our single audit report, which is the federal programs and state projects, the grants that you all are spending during the year, we had two qualified opinions, meaning we had two instances of noncompliance um, and then unmodified opinions on the other programs. So what that means is, is that everything was clean and within the compliance requirements except for two areas, um, which I'll highlight on the next slide as we get into some of the findings. Uh, our management letter, we had no comments that were reported. Uh, we work with county staff um, throughout the year uh, on any sort of recommendations, best practices, things along those lines. We don't put things like that necessarily in a management letter as they're not findings. It's more of just suggestions, things we see elsewhere throughout other clients uh, across Florida and across the country. 
Um, but then, of course, we have an independence auditor, uh, excuse me, accountant's report, and that was also unmodified attestation of opinion on compliance with state statutes. So generally clean all around. Um, so our communications to you all, the scope and the timing of the audit, uh, it, it was proceeded as planned. There were no changes, issues, anything along those lines. Um, the county's accounting policies are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles and practices. Uh, no difficulties were encountered uh, in performing the audit. Significant risks that we have to address uh, using our risk assessment, our auditor's judgment, they were addressed as planned, no issues, anything along those lines that we came across. We had three single audit findings, which are, again, that's the, the areas of noncompliance that were noted in looking at the administration of grant funds, and it was three programs. and. Without getting fully into the details on these, what these three findings really represent, it's, it's not that the funds were spent um, in an inaccurate way or on non-programmatic expenditures. With every grant program, there's significant compliance requirements that are unique to those programs as far as reports that are filed, certain timelines that have to be followed, just very, very specific rules uh, and instructions. And the, the findings all relate to either gaps in the compliance being followed or things just not being done in a timely manner. They were done late after the fact, um, not in the full compliance of the federal requirements. So we have to note findings when those three things occur. And so that's what those three represent. We have the actual programs that they were related to listed here on the slide. Um, but from a going forward standpoint, the county implements corrective action plans to say this is how we're going to address these. Uh, correct them going forward with a date for that corrective action. And that's also included in the financial documents that you have. And then when we start next year's audit, that will be the first thing that we start with, is we will look at prior year findings, make sure they've been addressed as planned, and then we will continue going forward with 2024 planning and assessment. Um, and then the last bullet here, um, I'd, I'd be remiss not to thank everybody that had a huge part uh, in helping us complete the audit. Um, it's a pleasure working with everybody here at the county. Um, it's always um, a cooperative, collaborative effort to get our audit done throughout the year. We ask for a lot of information. As Derek said, it starts in June and ends here in March. So it is a nine month process of providing support, answering questions, things along those lines, and everybody from the county departments, the clerk's office, and all the constitutional officers that play a part in this process were great and a pleasure to work with. So a huge thank you to everybody uh, here within the county. Just some quick takeaways for 2023. So we talk about the results of the audit. Just a highlight, the county's federal grants and state projects are a big emphasis point from an audit standpoint. I know they're a big emphasis point from a management standpoint of you all administering these. We audited over $64 million of the county's grant expenditures during 2023. And when you just look at the two I've highlighted here, the FEMA grant of $23.8 million and the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds of $23.5 million make up over two-thirds of that. So as you all continue processing FEMA claims, as some of these pandemic-era funds continue to work their way through, those will still be a significant emphasis of audit going forward. Um, there was a new accounting standard that the county had to implement related to GASB 96. I will not bore you with the details of that accounting rule. Just know it was a very large lift of everyone within the entire county to analyze all contracts for potential subscriptions that may meet the qualifications of this accounting rule. There were no issues in the county's implementation. Everyone did a great job with it, and it was a big, big lift for everybody to get that done as clean as it was. So we're thankful for that as well. And then quickly, financial highlights. I've just highlighted a couple of the results that are included within your numbers here. Your governmental activities, which is the, the accumulation of all your governmental funds, you had an increase of your net position of $257.1 million for fiscal year 23. Business type activities, an increase of your net position of 66.1. And the general fund, which is part of the governmental activities number there, there was an increase of fund balance, excuse me, <coughs> of $6.9 million there as well. So across the board, the majority of the funds had um, positive financial results that are within those numbers. So as you look through that financial document, these are just three of the many, many numbers that are in there. Um, but your management's discussion and analysis that's included within there that's prepared by county management includes some of that narrative around why some of the numbers ended up the way they are. And that would be the area that really tells that story within the document. 
So that is the end of my prepared comments. So I appreciate you all giving us some time to speak with you today. Um, I'd love to pause for questions, comments from the board. Uh, Mr. Kessler, you did great. And uh, three things. I'm glad to know that we have money. I'm glad to know that we don't have any cases of unmodified attestation, whatever that is. <laughs> And I'm most proud that everybody was um, cooperative, helpful, and professional in the process. So great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pardon? Commissioners, we just need a motion to accept the, the presentation and accept the act for. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the acceptance of the report. Okay. I'll second it. All right. It's Motion and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Good job, gentlemen. And I would like to say thank you to all of the constitutional officers who participated in this because I did hear the word heavy lift, and I know that there was great effort in that and I appreciate it all. Commissioners, that brings us back to item 11B. This is a recommendation to approve a naming rights agreement with the David Lawrence Mental Health Center, Inc., relative to the Collier County Behavioral Health Center to generate donations to be restricted specifically for use within the Behavioral Health Center. Mr. Ed Finn is here to present to your Deputy County Manager. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Edward Finn, Deputy County Manager. Um, um, if I may, um, Item 11B involves approving an agreement with uh, the David Lawrence Center that grants the right to raise funding through the, na through the naming of various elements of the new Collier County Behavioral Health Center. Um, as planning for that Behavioral Health Center uh, has progressed funding gaps for both furniture, fixtures, and equipment uh, and facility operating cost needs have been recognized. Um, David Lawrence Center leadership has met with key community um, community stakeholders to address these unfunded aspects of the program and develop the uh, Hope for Collier Building Stronger Minds Together campaign. Um, through this campaign, uh, David Lawrence Center tends to raise critical funding for both capital uh, and operating and maintenance of the new uh, Behavioral Health Center and Earmark raised funds uh, for that purpose. Um, the funds raised through the program will be restricted for use at the facility. Uh, funds will be maintained in a segregated account owned by David Lawrence uh, and restricted specifically for the use in the facility and the clerk of courts is authorized uh, to inspect and audit uh, the books and records. Uh, the naming program will be managed by David Lawrence. Uh, donors will be required to execute a charitable pledge agreement. Um, each pledge agreement uh, is subject to approval by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, with that, I'll be happy to answer any any questions? Um, Mr. McDaniel. Um, let me get to my notes. Um, I, 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 I have an issue with this. Um, I, I think it's leading us to a place that uh, could be quite controversial. I would prefer that we uh, – I understand the rationale behind it, that there's been – talk about these deficits for furniture fixtures and equipment there's been talk about the the uh, insufficient funds for O&M uh, operations and maintenance and they need to be made up somehow some way um, I, I would suggest that a lease modification be the path that we travel with uh, DLC David Lawrence Center uh, in lieu of a naming rights agreement and a specific audit provision for our clerk. Um, I would suggest that David Lawrence be allowed to um, get philanthropic dollars in any necessary manner that they can. And if a naming rights comes about, then great. Um, and then in the event that um, there is requisite for additional county support to either offset the the known deficits that have been described that that's when our our clerk could come in for an audit of how david lawrence is in fact spending all of their money across the board as opposed to this agreement um that's that's been brought before me 
Are you saying allow naming rights for David Lawrence Center to, to do their naming rights to raise money, but not just not to do it in this agreement? Correct. And I think it's a um, uh, it, it would requisite an adjustment or an amendment to the lease agreement with them to allow them to accept philanthropic dollars in other manners and utilize them in accordance with their general operations um, to either offset the, the, the deficits of FF&E or the O&M. Um, and then in the event that they need to come back to the county for additional assistance, then, then we can have discussions with regard to the clerk's audit of all of their revenues and all of their expenses and how they're going. Um, I, I, I really highly recommend that, that uh, David Lawrence seek philanthropic dollars to assist, but philanthropic dollars don't always, aren't always reoccurring funds. And so I, when I was reading through this naming rights agreement, I, I saw potential for each individual case to have to come back to us, which could then put this board or this or our county in prejudicial circumstances uh, approving one over another. And I, I'd rather we I'd rather we not be in that position if we're going to. Uh, the county's going to own this facility. David Lawrence is going to operate this facility. And if they're going to uh, seek and receive philanthropic dollars, I, I highly recommend that they have that accommodation be, be provided within their lease agreement. Great. Commissioner Saunders. Um, thank you. I, I may take a slightly different approach. Um, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Finn, in terms of the how the ownership of this project is, can you can you go through those details? Because I know David Lawrence had purchased the property, the the, uh, the real estate. Uh, I know we're paying the lion's share, if you will, for the construction of the building. But w what is the ownership structure of this whole project? I'm going to uh, go go deep to try to answer this one. Um, I think we're going to find that the. Um, uh, David Lawrence Center et al. had originally purchased the property through a selection process. Uh, the site was selected for this facility. Um, there has already been board action to essentially put in place a long-term lease with David Lawrence Center. And somewhere in that transaction, I believe we are acquiring that property from David Lawrence Center. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Klatskow? So we will own the, the building and the land? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Uh, OK. Well, that's, I think it would be nice to know that, but um, I'd like to, I think in terms of the naming rights and some of those types of issues, David Lawrence Center has been doing this for a long, long time. We have not, and I, my sort of gut feeling is let's let them take the reins and run with it and we need to stay out of it because uh, you mentioned uh, being prejudicial in terms of selecting one own, one naming right person over another. I, I don't know that we want to be involved in any of that. We don't know how to do it. And I don't think anybody on our staff wants to learn how to. Um, so I, I think, but I think the ownership issue is important because if we own the building and we own the land, uh, that's, that's one scenario. If they actually own this and we're, we're providing the funds to construct it. Uh, somebody, this is uh, ours. Okay. You know, we, that, that center is the county's. We, we, we couldn't use this infrastructure sales tax if it wasn't. So, so we do control it. All right. So we own the land and the building, and they're going to they're going to manage it. Yes, they're they're the operator. So, I, I don't know if that changes significantly my thoughts in terms of of naming rights and all of those types of things, because I, I know I don't want to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's too political when we put it into a, into a process before the board. Um, to, to steal a phrase, um, we can do anything, but we can't do everything, certainly not everything well. Um, yes, I would concur with that. Commissioner Castro. Yeah, I just wanted to give clarity, but the county attorney already did. Um, so we own the land and the building. They're, they basically manage it. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to raise money philanthropically. I didn't initially have a, an issue with with this and 
I, I agree with Commissioner Saunders. I mean, when naming rights and, you know, when I used to work at Avow, I mean, they, they had naming rights for water fountains practically, and, and it brought in a lot of money. And, and yeah, sometimes there can be some presidential um, uh, issues with, you know, two people that want the same thing. And I, I agree with Commissioner Saunders. Let David Lawrence sort, sort that out when they bring us a recommendation if we think there's an issue or we're hearing from citizens that, hey, there's something unfair going on. Well, then maybe we're sort of that the secondary party that is, is – and I hope that doesn't happen – but I, I think we run the risk of, of sort of making this a little too, too difficult. Um, what I read here sounded fine to me initially. So what I would say to my colleagues is those of you that have raised an issue and have a problem with it, I need more clarity and more simplicity as to um, why um, your way isn't just different, but it is better. And I'm open to hearing that. I, I guess I, I, couldn't, I couldn't decipher in the words um, I was hearing more of just a different approach with the same end result, but I didn't hear the advantage or disadvantage. What I did hear with clarity was what Commissioner Saunders said, which is, you know, the same way I don't think the county should be in the real estate business um, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things sometimes that we get into. I thought it was pretty clear, let the management team manage and and bring us recommendations or you know maybe we get final approval on something if there's some um uh, issue or some you know some sort of um uh you know a, a problem or, or or what have you but um you know before i i vote either way i'm hearing you know some some concerns from my colleagues but i didn't i didn't hear it with enough specificity that made me think there was something wrong with this proposal that and like I said, there's so many different ways you can do it. I, what I heard, and that's where I'm looking for you to correct it for me. I just heard some different ways to do it, but I didn't hear that it was any better. Um, so I guess you know, convince me either way, because I think what's currently proposed, I was prepared to vote for it without any hesitation at all. Um, and like Commissioner Saunders says, we always reserve the right to have something come before us that maybe we have an issue with. And, you know, we, 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 we're, we're, we're the overseers of David Lawrence, so it's not like they can just operate on autopilot. But, you know, with that, I'll leave it to my colleagues who have pushed their buttons with concerns and maybe re-summarize what you're trying to, you know, have us all understand that you think is a, a negative with the current way or that you have a not a negative, but that you have a, a way that would make it um, more positive or, or better in some way. So before I go to Commissioner McDaniel, I want to just make a comment. When David Lawrence Center was here, I encouraged them to come up with their own money for the fixtures and the, and the deficit. And I can see that this is a creative way to get that done. However, I like Commissioner DeCastro, uh, I like the creative idea of them being able to do their naming rights. But now listening to y'all, I don't want to be the naming rights police. Because if they get a large donation and it's from the Death to America Society, we're, that's going to come before us and we're not necessarily going to be in favor of that and that could put us in a bad situation. Um, so. We're not saying that they can't. We're not saying that they can't go to the public and raise money with naming rights. We're just saying that we don't want to be involved as the as the naming rights police. If that's what I'm hearing, basically. Okay. I mean, don't you think though, if they got one of those, um, like you said, a million dollar donation from an organization that totally was out to lunch, that, that they would they would kill it immediately. That they don't blindly just say, oh, a million dollars from death um, to police, we'll take it. I mean, I don't think they that. And I know that you're being extreme in your example, but it's a, you know, that's what we're trying to avoid. But I think that they wouldn't come to us and say, well, we got a million dollars from an organization that we think is a little bit shady, but you know, it is a million dollars. What do you guys think? I don't think they're gonna. I, I know they wouldn't drop that um, in our inbox and, and make us the police for it. I don't think that's the intention. Um, and like you said, I think it leaves the responsibility in their court, and um, they would use good judgment, I would expect, as they have, you know, their entire history here in Collier County. Um, you know, the responsibility sits with them, and they're trying to ag aggressively. We all suggested to them that there's a deficit um, and come up with some ways to do it. This, this way isn't anything above the norm. Hell, we're looking for naming rights for our sports complex, <laughs> you know. I mean, so it's this isn't something that's totally out to lunch. And and managing it and overseeing it and being responsible with who you're going to accept naming rights from is, is, is an obvious responsibility of the task, I, I would think. Um.
Mr. McDaniel. Yes. And and with that, if you want to speak up, County Manager, when I raised this concern yesterday, Commissioner Saunders said it a little more eloquently than I, but uh, uh, my concern is with the agreement for the naming rights that's been brought in, and I, th I believe under the current ownership interest and the lease of our property to them to manage, they, they require an adjustment to that lease to be able to accept philanthropic dollars from whatever manner, in fact, that they choose to do. And so that's my suggestion is we not enter into this, this, this naming rights agreement, but adjust the lease to allow them to do those things uh, accordingly. Um, you know, and specifically, Commissioner LeCastro, on number three of the existing agreement, it says that the county reserves the right to deny such charitable pledge agreements if proposed naming adversely impacts the reputation, image, mission, or integrity of the county or is in violation, and I agree, or is in violation with the naming policy at its sole discretion. And it, the, as Commissioner Saunders said, it kind of makes us the police, and I don't want to be there either. So I suggest we amend the lease, give, put a provision in there to allow them to accept philanthropic, the, the lease for the management of our facility, and allow them to accept philanthropic dollars as in fact they wish to do so, and if they want to name a bird fountain, so be it. Commissioners, we do have representation from David Lawrence here, just in case you have any questions that you'd like to direct towards them. And I think the important thing today was that we at least understand your interest or tolerance for naming rights because they do have donors and others that they want to be talking to and didn't want to get out ahead of you. If we have to work through, if it's by way of a lease or by way of a, a, some other type of agreement, I think that that's okay. What they're looking for is that guidance that you're okay with at least the conversation about naming rights. No problem if you want us to look at another vehicle. And I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Feel free to approach the podium if you'd like to add anything. If, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, Nancy Dolphinet, uh, the uh, Chief Operating Officer for David Lawrence Center is a registered speaker, um, and she may or may not want to speak, but certainly um, she will impress upon you that time is of the essence, so that if the Board uh, wants to direct us to uh, instead um, do an addendum <coughs> excuse me, to the lease agreement, uh, we certainly can do that. We just don't want to lose much time, and uh, insofar as the Board deliberating on this, uh, if they do not want to be engaged in approving these agreements, um, that direction probably facilitate us getting this done quickly. I do see the clerk also, if we can let her come up before we close out this conversation. Yes, <laughs> trying to be timely today. Um, I don't want to muddy the water, so what I will say is I've heard a couple of good things that I think would be workable and manageable. I'm struggling with the newest idea, however, of allowing the naming rights, so you're literally making the dollars off of the county's assets privately, so there would need to be accountability in some respect because of the lease and because of those other agreements. So I think there are ways to structure this. Um, I agree with you, Commissioner uh, Hall. When it first came up, I was under the impression that David Lawrence was going to raise the funds for the equipment. So now, if there is some agreement for the board to um, help with that, either through naming rights or otherwise, we probably need to vet that a little closely. So I just wanted to offer that information. Thank you. Mr. Saunders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't have any particular preference whether this is a lease amendment or a separate agreement. I think it, from a legal standpoint, it has the same effect. So don't have any, any issues with that. But I'll just reiterate, uh, I think uh, the, the clerk will have to audit those revenues because, as she said, that we're, these are dollars coming in naming uh, a building that we own. I understand that. But in terms of naming and making those selections, I, my view is leave it 100% with David Lawrence. I don't think they're going to do anything that would be controversial or something that we would find objectionable. They're, they've been here for a long time. They're going to be here for a long time. So I, I just don't want to be involved in trying to help or decide whether the water fountain is going to be named after Mr. X or Mr. Y. Uh, 
but I do believe that the clerk should have full auditing responsibilities over any revenues associated with uh, with those naming rights, and the naming and the, that revenue has to be restricted to uh, operating uh, the facility. And I think David Lawrence understands that. So that's just my view. I don't care if it's in the in the lease or a separate agreement. Mr. LeCastro. Yeah, I mean, I had some notes written down here, but I mean, I'd, I'll just say I confirm, I, I concur with Commissioner Saunders. Um, if the lease adds a little extra something, I mean, I think it's six one half dozen the other, but if it's something that other commissioners feel strongly about, I still think it gets us the final end result. So um, I would just echo what Commissioner Saunders um, said. I would, I would support this with lease or no lease, if, but, you know, obviously we want to try to move forward here. I don't think putting in the lease, um, uh, makes me not want to support it um, or that it's required. So to me, it's either way. Um, but I think in the end, being able to move forward, you know, I'll echo and say we, we obviously want strong um, uh, clerk of court oversight. So, you know, when Crystal came up here and says, you know, there's many ways to do this, I think we defer to her and say, bring us the best way, <laughs> you know, or let us know if they're not doing the best way. But, um, you know, I don't, I'm not here to um, to to slow this down um, over um, a couple of of details that I think we can we can still work through while this still moves forward in a positive direction. So that's just my view, Mr. McDaniel. Yeah, and I don't have any preference on how we do this. I just don't want to be in a position of being the, as was stated, the police for who gets to name what. Period. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the clerk has the right and should audit any lessee that's utilizing government our government buildings so uh, um, i i i so how we get there it really doesn't matter to me i but i don't want this lease i don't want this naming rights agreement so i'm going to make a motion for if i'm if i may sir uh, just just for clarity uh the audit audit requirements will remain in uh, the board is pretty clear they do not want to be approving uh, the individual uh, namees, if you will. Um, and with that direction, uh, I believe Commissioner is also going to suggest that we make this an addendum or an amendment to the current lease agreement, in which case uh, we will take care of all those things into consideration and bring that back at your direction, sir. So if you care to make that motion. I'll make that as the motion, then. That's what I said at the beginning, so yes. So just, just to be clear, David Lawrence Center have the, the ultimate right to raise their funds on their own, naming rights if, if they chose, so choose. We're going to make it an adjustment to the lease for them to have the right to uh, raise money from the philanthropic, did I say that right, yeah. community? And uh, do we want to add anything in there with the ultimate right to refuse any name? Yeah, that was going to be my question. I, I, I just think that there, there should always be a line in there that gives us the ultimate sort of trump card. Um, if I don't expect them to bring us something that was controversial, but if you didn't have it in there, it could be a problem. And by it being in there, I think it makes it um, more, um, makes it as correct as, as possible. Um, it might just be sort of an, a, a, an official type of thing at the end, but I think it, something needs to be in there, giving us the ultimate authority to reject something should, should something be going in. I don't know the right sort of verbiage, but, um, and I'd be fine with the lease. Maybe I'll ask the county attorney, but perhaps some after the I think we'll come back. Ed and I will we'll talk about this, and we'll come back at a future agenda. But I would say not too long. I mean, if you're saying time is of the essence, we're not building oh, yeah. the Empire State Building here, so make the change, and let's see it at the next meeting. Our, our, our intent would be to bring this back as quickly as possible. It should be fairly routine. Mr. Saunders. Thank you. So I think uh, I'll, I'll use the phrase that some of you have quoted in the past, the wor words matter. Uh, and when you say that the board has the ultimate final decision, if it's going to be something that might be problematic in some way, um, I think that opens the door to if two people are trying to name something and they do they appeal to us. I just think we should be out of it completely. And if David Lawrence Center does something stupid and names it after some organization that uh, is reprehensible, which they would not do, then there'd be uh, a price to pay in terms of their philanthropy going forward. So I, I, just, I just don't think we should be involved in the, in the naming of, of that because however you phrase it, if we're the final arbiter, that means it comes to us. Or, um, I didn't, so I would just be clear, and I, I don't disagree with you. I think saying we're the final arbiter um, 
and, and regardless of what they name is not my intention, but having something in there to say that we reserve the right, that means we may never do it. But it gives us a one line in there that says, should we see something or should we all get a thousand emails from an organization? It just it gives us the latitude to possibly. So I don't I don't want to be the person that rubber stamps every water fountain. But I thought, but you know, as a as an, an attorney, you know, yourself, if like, like, I don't disagree with what you said i thought the intention would be a one-liner at the end just um make not making us the ultimate uh, approval of every single naming but reserving the right should the, the 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 case arise although it might be overkill we might be splitting a hair here i agree with you this is an organization that i don't think is gonna um br bring uh, name something that's super controversial and, and if they did um exactly as you said commissioner saunders boy they would it, it would be on them but then it could be on us by somebody saying gosh you didn't put a line in there that gave you you guys the authority to that in the unlikely event you you could you could jump in so that's all i was i was saying that was all and, my and if i and if i may mr yeah. chair the uh, underlying pledge uh, between uh, the person making the donation um, does in fact have a clause uh, not dissimilar to what you're seeing here relative to the relationship between david lawrence center and the um, and the donor so that exists there um, within the system that we're setting up mr mcdaniel and, and to to that point, every single one of our lease agreements has the cancellation provision for convenience. And so, as Commissioner Saunders said, if David Lawrence does something not to hoil, we cancel the lease. And so we have that ultimate right without actually stating it to be the arbiter on on a particular on a particular donation. So I think. Uh, Making the as been suggested, making the lease amendments to uh, to them as the management of our building, we're covered. The clerk is auditing uh, their facilities and their operations. So I think uh, denying this naming rights agreement is a prudent way for us to go. Commissioner Castro. The only thing I don't like about what you just said is putting the lease in jeopardy because we have a disagreement over a naming it seems to be jumping to like step 10. And so that's why I thought we, we take a smaller bite of the apple and we just say if we have a discrepancy on naming, um, you know, we, we reserve the right to, to have a conversation with you. What I'm hearing you say is, well, it's in the, in the lease and we could always cancel the lease. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If they name a water fountain after the wrong person, all of a sudden the lease is in jeopardy of being canceled. I just think that's a bridge too far. I don't want to, you know, like I said, I don't want to split hairs here. But um, and we do want to get this right. But um, I wouldn't agree with that hanging the lease over their head that if they they have a misstep and having done this, like I said, with another organization in, in town, a hospice organization, when two people want to name a water fountain um, and they're both legitimate people, they're not a controversial organization. You know who gets to name it? Whoever writes the biggest check. That's what naming rights are all about. So there, there, there usually isn't some sort of controversy unless it's some sort of an individual that has maybe a shady background or an organization that we don't want to be associated with. But you know, sometimes 10 people come forward and they all want to name the operating room um, in a hospital, and the person that gets to name it is whoever is the most generous. I mean, that, that's, that's what happens. <laughs> and, it's, and then there's no controversy. It doesn't come to us. David Lawrence Center comes and says, we had 10 people that all wanted to name the building, and we gave it to Mr. and Mrs. X because they were the most generous, and of course, we're trying to raise the most money. But I wouldn't want to put the lease in, and, and I, I, I know the spirit of what you're saying. I just want to pull back um, on the stick a little bit because I just think that that's a little bit, um, a, a little bit of a bridge too far um, for something that we might just disagree on that's at a smaller, lower level rather than just, well, the lease is in jeopardy. I don't, I don't think we want to put the lease in jeopardy over naming rights of, of you know, a room or a water fountain like we keep saying, but that, that's my thought. Yeah, I agree. I mean, with the right to refuse doesn't mean we'll ever, uh, and when you think about David Lawrence Center class organization, we'll never see this but we're not always going to be here. The people that are running it are not always going to be here. So the future board, if anything, we all know how the moral character of the country declines rapidly. So if there was anything that ever popped up in Collier County, the board would have the right to talk, have that discussion. Doesn't mean that they're, they're going to be arbitrarily approving everything or we're totally going to give it into the hands of David Lawrence Center but with the right to refuse. And that's all I was, that's, that's really where I'm comfortable at. If you're, if you don't want that, and you just want the will, just the, the adjustment in the lease, comfortable with that too. 
So we have a, what's the motion? The motion, yeah. motion, <laughs> the motion is to not accept this naming agreement as presented and make the necessary adjustments in the lease and then we can review those when they bring them back. Okay. Motion is to, is to deny that. All in favor of denying it, say aye. 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 All opposed? I would just. Did we get a second? That's fine. I'll second it, but I'll, I'll, I'll second it. In retrospect, Commissioner LeCastro seconds the I'll move. second it with an asterisk saying that I don't think any of us are here <laughs> kicking this to the curb. We're, you know, and maybe we didn't even need to vote on it because a lot of times, too, when we have an issue, instead of voting, we say, hey, staff, come back to us at the next meeting with a better one. So I don't want the, the message to be that five commissioners voted against David Lawrence Center's naming of anything. What we've said is we think there could be stronger wordage, verbiage here. And we want you to come back in two, no later than two weeks so that we're not burning the candle too slowly and bring us back something that we can all. So I don't, I don't know that a vote's really required here because what we're saying is we want you to come, but, but maybe it is. But, but I don't really think it is. And I don't want to give the, like I said, the wrong impression that all five of us here just shot this down. Oh. What we've done is we, we all agree that the wording could be um, tighter. Uh, to make us uh, all feel better. I, I think we're clear. Uh, I think the board is supportive of this in concept. We're going to bring this back in the form of an amendment to the lease. Um, we will uh, be considering some high-level right of refusal at some high level to propose to the board, uh, and we will expedite it as much as possible. Yeah. So maybe no second needed, and you know we'll see in two weeks. Oh, we've, right, we have to. No. We're, we're being we're being called to vote on this naming rights agreement. So. All right. So we have a motion to deny this naming this agreement. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> we have a second. All in favor of not approving this service agreement say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. We'll see you in two weeks with the with the lease agreement. Very good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. That's not an FSU tie, is it? Uh, I think it's a Harry Potter tie. Uh, um, Nancy, you'll work with <laughs> us, right, to get us the right verbiage, right? Yeah. You hear the, you hear our heart, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> We're old. Yeah. He's a Hufflepuff, I think, right? Yeah, I'm just uh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. Commissioner's item 11C is a recommendation to consider alternatives for the communication tower site at Max Haas Junior Community Park and direct the county manager or designate either one, take no action allowing the existing lease to expire on May 20th, 2024, pursuant to Crown Castle's termination notice and authorize the county manager or designee to proceed with competitive selection of a wireless communication tower tenant at Max Haas Community Park, or two, update ground lease terms with Crown Castle Towers 06-2 LLC, a subsidiary of Crown Castle USA, and return to the board for approval of the updated ground lease at a future meeting. Mr. Ed Finn, your Deputy County Manager, will begin the presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Ed Finn, Deputy County Manager. Um, relative to this, this site, um, I guess to kind of start at a super high level, um, this is to consider these alternatives uh, for this tower site at the Max Haas Community Park. Um, it provides, a, the item provides a discussion um, of that situation. Uh, the tower site has been under a lease agreement since 2010 with Crown Castle assuming the lease in 2013. Uh, today we have an unimproved tower site uh, and a termination letter from Crown Castle that is effective on May 30th of this year. Uh, that being said, uh, our objective today, uh, much as the county manager said, is to um, option one is to take no action allowing the lease to expire, um, potentially authorizing the county manager or designee to proceed with a procurement effort um, to get a tower uh, constructed on that site. Uh, the alternative two is to update the uh, lease terms with Crown Castle Towers 06-2. LLC, a subsidiary of Crown Castle USA, and return to the board uh, with approval of an updated ground lease. Um, some of the considerations, um, the letter I mentioned, um, the establishment date was mentioned, the, um, current, the current rent is approximately uh, 78,400 78, per year. Uh, that is probably 20 to $30,000 higher than our typical lease. Uh, that being said, this, this is viewed as one of our uh, best, best performing ground leases, if you will, with the exception, of course, of 
no not tower. providing a tower. Um, that being said, uh, the, the terms that we've discussed, and, and perhaps I'll just cite this a little bit for you. Uh, you can see the uh, arrow points to the Max House site, and um, on the site you'll see that the tower location is uh, is parked uh, kind of in the middle, a fair distance away from the uh, property boundaries. Um, some of the considerations that uh, Crown Castle has suggested, um, the the height adjustment is is one of simply allowing the lease to go up to the uh, permitted height that currently exists as opposed to a, a limit that was established in 2010. Uh, they're looking for some consideration uh, in reducing the, the rent to make this economically feasible in their view. Um, and we had some alternatives that, that we would consider uh, negotiating with them uh, if the board elects to move in that direction. Uh, with that said, um, I guess I'll just go back to the considerations, if you will. Um, this is kind of where we where we see the options at this point in time. Um, I will say that uh, Peter uh, Bedeckia of Crown Castle, uh, I believe, may have registered to speak, so uh, he, he could answer any questions for you. Uh, and Mr. Bosey, of course, is here, and uh, he, too, could answer any questions that you may have. Let's hear the public speaker, and then we'll go into our comments. Mr. Verdecchia. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Commissioners. Um, I am Peter Verdecchia. I am a project manager with Crown Castle Real Estate, and I am have been working with Mr. Finn and Jennifer, Ms. Belpedio, on possible renegotiation of the ground lease that exists at Max Haas Park for the, for the construction of a communications tower. <clears throat> uh, to date, we have paid roughly 700000 in ground lease expenses over the last 13 years since we acquired the site from AT&T. We have not been able to construct the tower due to the uh, economic issues and the space constraints associated with the existing terms of the ground lease. And so we have proposed to uh, amend the ground lease pursuant to what you have seen. And we've worked with them to come to that ag a rough agreement and would like to be able to proceed with those negotiations, uh, establish an amended lease agreement sufficient with terms sufficient for us to proceed to construction of the tower site and solicit uh, wireless carriers to install. I would also add <clears throat> that this the agreement that we, what we've agreed to includes um, allowance for Collier County Public Safety to install at multiple RAD centers and includes ground space rights for Collier County Public Safety as well. How do you say your last name? Verdecchia. Verdecchia. Yes, sir. I have a question. So we've had this lease for, you say, 13 years? Uh, since 2010, so 14 years. Yes. Okay. So you haven't been able to construct a tower because of the ground lease. So why, nine years ago, didn't you come to us and say, hey, if you'll just adjust the ground lease, we'll get you a tower in the air? I wish I could answer that question. I. Me too. I've seen emails where we did try to negoti renegotiate it with uh, Michael Dowling back when he sat in the real estate position at Collier County. That was, I believe, back in 2019, 2020. Um, this, the lease agreement was originally established by AT&T and acquired by Crown Castle. And so I, I've only sat in this role for two years, and I've been working diligently to have this lease amended sufficient so we can construct the tower for those two years. Uh, it's taken a good bit of effort and time to get to this point. Great. Thank you. Commissioner McDaniel. I, uh, my, my questions are two. I mean, and, and I feel as strongly as the chairman does with regard to the lack thereof a tower at all. My question for staff is what prohibitions on the existing ground lease terms and conditions uh, have been prohibitive for the construction of a tower? Do they want to build a higher tower than what we currently allow? Uh, as I understand it, and, and Mr. Videckia can speak, uh, speak more specifically, uh, I believe that the, um, the lease that we're charging, uh, which has a fairly aggressive uh, adjustment every year, uh, it's limited to CPI or 5%. And as I noted, at 78,000, it is our best performing uh, tower lease site. Um, it has been represented to staff that 
that is a fiscal dynamic that makes this difficult to be profitable. Um, there is also a relatively small footprint. This is about a 900 square foot lease presently, uh, and the request is to increase it to 2,100 square foot, uh, plus uh, potentially a, a need for a little more space for buffer. So economic factors combined with uh, limited square footage is what's been represented to staff as why this hasn't been done in recent memory. I, can, I cannot speak back uh, 10, 14 years on this either. And we don't really need to go there. By my, I guess what's going to get us to having a tower as quickly as possible? We have the need. The need is past due. And, and I'm glad you asked that. It, um, I, I will say quite, quite specifically, if you sign a, to a lease for a tower site and you fail to compel the construction of a tower site in that lease, you end up with this situation. So in the, if the board were to elect to move in the direction of uh, renegotiating the tower lease, we would establish a framework to compel the construction of that tower as much as possible. The lease limits the tower to 160 feet. Uh, that, that is one of the considerations going forward would be to adjust that height um, to what is allowed under code today. And that, that may be then a larger footprint for uh, the, the, f for the existence of the tower other than what currently is allowed under the existing lease? And I will let um, uh, Peter respond to this. I will say the request is to go from about 900 square foot to 2,100 square foot. The specifics of why that's required, perhaps I can toss over. Yep, I'll be happy to speak to that. Um, <clears throat> so we need the additional ground space to be able to co-locate all the major wireless carriers. And so they need a specific amount of space to place their shelters, emergency backup generators, uh, as well as ice bridges and everything else that goes into a tower. That turns out to be roughly you know, a few pieces of 10 by 20 space. And so that, it, that in combination with the space that we are providing Collier County, uh, that is the amount of space that we are looking for to be able to solicit all the wireless carriers and do so quickly without having to come back and renegotiate for additional space each time we get interest from a wireless carrier. So, so. <laughs> I hear you thinking. Yeah, well, <laughs> smell smell sorry it. for thinking so loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my. And, if, and if I may, sir, um, the, what's proposed here is to have the tower constructed in two years uh, with an incentive to get it done in 18 months, the incentive being uh, the rent would stay the same until the tower is completed. If it's completed in 18 months, we would then credit them for the difference in the, in the rent. Uh, if it goes 24, year, uh, 24 months, uh, they would not be credited for that, uh, but the rent would change when the tower was constructed to a lower rate. Um, the other area of interest is uh, also requested is a 30-year extension, which would bring this ground lease out to uh, 2071, which uh, is a long way out. Uh, yeah, the nature not. of these towers typically tends to be long-term. Uh, that, that may, in fact, be a, a bridge too far, but um, we'll leave that to the negotiation if the board directs us to do so. And in comparison to other uh, tower leases that we, in fact, have, you said that this is the most lucrative. Is it the most lucrative because it's just gone up by 5% a year for the past 20 years or however long it's been in existence? 13, 14 years. Uh, part of it is the annual adjustment. Part of it is it was established at a, a reasonable rate. I believe it was in the high 30s when it was established uh, in um, uh, 2010. So... Uh, and well, it, was, it was either the CPI or the actual rate of inflation. So certainly the last uh, two, three years, it has accelerated in its, in its uh, adjustment. Well, my initial inclination was to allow the uh, expiration and go back out for bid and through, go through procurement again. But that doesn't spell a tower, uh, a direly needed tower. And so my, I, I'll, I'll be interested to hear what what the rest of my colleagues have to say. Mr. Saunders. Thank you. I guess a couple comments and then uh, maybe a question or two here and there. 
Um, I'm not concerned about the past. If they've paid $700,000 over the last 13 years, that's, that's not an issue. That's not a factor in going forward. Um, the fact that this is higher performing uh, than all of our other leases is really a factor either. Uh, what is a factor is what is the now going market rate for a space with it, and I have no issue with 2,100 square feet. What is the going rate now for a communications tower? And I don't know if staff's had the ability or the opportunity to explore the market, talk to people that are in that business to see what types of rentals are um, available. But I think that that's what's important is what what is that rental worth today going forward, not anything in the past. Uh, we do have a lease that's going, going to expire. We have a termination letter, and we do have a process for soliciting proposals. And I'm, I'm just throwing this out as maybe that's the way we should go to make sure that we're getting the right price. I'm looking at numbers here, $2,500, 3% you know, uh, annual escalator. I don't know if that's anything reasonable or not. I know that, that, the, that the staff has had some, I, I assume you're struggling a little bit with what, what is this really worth. Well, there's really only one way to find out, and that is to uh, explore the market through some competitive selection. And I don't know if that slows us down significantly or not, um, because I think staff is pretty capable of getting a request for proposals or an invitation to negotiate or something out pretty quickly. But I'm just throwing that out because I'm, I'm concerned about what is really the right answer, uh, not necessarily what is the quick answer to get a tower up as quickly as possible, which we want to do, but at the same time making sure that we're protecting the taxpayers in terms of getting what's what's fair and right for this this project. Mr. Kowal. Thank you, Chair. Um, I look at it in a way you're looking at Commissioner Saunders too, but I'm also looking at, you know, if we, we, we walk away today and say, all right, let's put this out to bid, let's, you know, procurement. and But I think we're going to have to pretty much make these adjustments to make it you know, dangle that carrot to make it for somebody else willing to come in and, and do what we need. Because the way it's written now with the 160 foot and the footprint where they've been paying to have, I guess, for a future, um, and what they're asking for now, what the staff is kind of recommending, is pretty much what would have to go out to bid anyways. So we would be, you know, especially if we want our public safety to be on there and, and the 160 foot probably wouldn't be suffice, the footprint wouldn't be to, the, the right size. So in reality, what they're asking for is basically what we'd have to put out the bid. And, you know, I don't know if that would be uh, any quicker or going through that process than it would be to just, you know, renegotiate this lease and have them start. And I, I, I think this other question, I don't know if it's for Mr. Finn or, or, or you, you, sir. Um, do you know if, because I know our ordinance for the towers, we've been visiting that for the last several months. And, you know, the ordinance itself has been pretty antiquated uh, com compared to what the new construction can do and how they can be constructed. I mean, is, did that play any kind of role in this numbers that we were looking at back in the original lease with the 160 foot due to the footprint or, or vice versa? I'm, I'm going to guess that the 160 foot established in the lease probably was pretty close to the limit at that point. Uh, I believe the limit now is 180, 85 Foot. Okay, I'm doing okay so far. So 185, 185, if we keep the footprint the same, what's in the lease, or if we go out to 2100? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the footprint is, is relevant. It's only relevant to the, the business operations of the tower. All right. So that's dependent on how many other uh, groups they have attached to the tower. Like um, Yes, yes. As uh, Mr. Bedecchio said, uh, he needs the additional ground space for the, uh, to serve the, to the needs of the tower occupants. So anybody else that would bid on this in the future possibly would probably need the same exact thing he's asking for then? Um, I, I, I would think so. Um, this is where we're at. Um, if the board were to direct us to bring back a negotiated lease, um, we have been looking at market, and it is a difficult market to evaluate what the, what the right price is. We would do some more work on that. Um, the proposal we have is probably lower than it, than it should be to start off given uh, the consideration we're going to be, or we would be providing. Uh, so we certainly, um, if directed, would bring that back, would kind of tighten up on our market analysis and bring back a recommendation that, that as best we could, achieve that market requirement for price. Mr. Castro. 
I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Um, listen, you've had all these years to build a tower, and you, know, you haven't built one. Um, if the lease is about to expire, I say let it expire. I put it out for bid. You're certainly allowed to bid on it, but a whole bunch of competitors will as well. We're going to take the best deal, and then we're going to tell those competitors, don't take 14 years to build a tower. Take 18 months, or you're not going to get the bid, or there's going to be some sort of penalty. So, And I think if that slows down the system a little bit, Guys, we haven't built anything in, in, in a decade or whatever the, the years were, so it's not like we've slowed down. It's been slow. So this is, the, you know, when, you, when your lease is about to, to run out, that, that's when you, you, you come here way earlier than this, as Commissioner Hall said, and, said, and say, oh, my gosh, you know, um, we don't want to lose this, and uh, how, how do we need to change the parameters of the lease? And you know what? Um, putting something out for RS, RFP is how you'll find out what the market is and how competitive it is, and if somebody really wants this plot of land and can do it much faster than what hasn't been done in the past, then, then we'll sort that out. And if somebody can't and they rebid, hey, you know, um, you might you might get the you might get the bid, and you might wind up paying a heck of a lot more. But it's because you had to outbid, you know, your competition. This is a competitive process, and just as as you said, Mr. Finn, we don't really know what the competition is. That's what an RSP, RFP is for. If we put it out for bid and they're the only bidders, then we know, wow, the market isn't as competitive as we thought. Nobody really wants it, and I don't think that that takes a whole lot of time. We've put things out for RFP here, and we. And our direction to the staff has been, please accelerate this. We did it right after the hurricane, and we said, you know, don't make this be a two-year process. Get it out. Um, it's an emergent type of thing. This may not fall in the emergent category, but you know, this shouldn't take five years to to, to find out um, if we've got a, a better company or if these guys can sharpen their pencils and rebid on a lease they've had. But the the the, the tower never showed up, and now it's. It's about to expire, so I'm I'm all for letting the lease expire unless somebody can talk me out of it. Um, I think to me this one's very very clear um, from a business um, standpoint. I realize the importance of the tower, but that importance has been important for a while, and we still haven't put shovels in the ground. So maybe it's time to send them a strong message by saying, you know, we're gonna we're gonna um, see what the competition is out there, and if you want to compete, jump in, and you know it might cost you a little bit more, but. We're not going to sit here and hand massage this lease that you've had for a while, especially when it's about to expire and we don't know what the what the competition is. And I have a feeling the competition is pretty strong out there. And as you said, I, I believe this is below market value right now, especially with how things have changed. And if I'm wrong, an RFP will prove that. So that's just my position. No, oh, well said. Um, initially, I came in here to just nip this in the bud and start over, just like you said. But that doesn't – what's really important is we get a dang tower. That's what's important. Amen. The amount of money on the lease is secondary. The term is, you know, if we go with somebody new, it's going to be 30 years anyway. I like the changes. I like the height. I like the fact that local agencies are going to have some space on there that, you know, a tower should be a tower that's going to benefit the community. I'm not – I'm not sold – on what the rent is. Uh, Commissioner Saunders had a great point. We ought to find out. We ought to find out what the market value is and match that. We got a bird in hand, and that's worth two in the bush as far as getting something done. I don't necessarily agree with giving them 18 months or two years. We can shorten that term way down. I mean, there, the, the man has stepped up to the podium with intent to do it. I think, you know, He's been here two years. We can't crucify him. It would be easy to try to, but, you know, he's here now saying, hey, we want to build a tower. We just need to do it like this. So uh, we have a lease that's not due until, what, the end of May? Uh, the, the letter actually terminates the lease as of May 30th. Okay. So we can rescind our letter if we need to. If we uh, the, uh, <laughs> the tenant presumably could rescind the letter. Okay. My my point is, I think we have time to find out very quickly what the market value is, adjust these terms to that, get something done that's agreeable with them, and get a tower to the public. And if that can't be done, then I'm all about what Commissioner Castro just said, nip it in the bud, start over with, and uh, see where the chips fall. Mr. McDaniel. Yes. Is my understanding correct that the current lease expires at the end of May? Uh, no, sir. There's a um, the tenant initiated a letter 
uh, to terminate the agreement effective May, uh, consistent with the terms of the lease that provided for a 90-day notice of termination mm -hmm. from the tenant. Okay. And so the, the current lease goes for another 90 days after the end of May? Uh, no, sir. The current lease goes to uh, 2031 from memory, if I'm not mistaken. 41, I think. 41? Very good. And there's no language in that to um, uh, compel the contractor to build a tower in the existing lease? Uh, uh, no, there's no there's no penalty for not building the tower. Um, uh, what, I, what I would say is um, May 30th um, should give us time to bring an bring an item back uh, rather than rescinding what we have I would say we come back before you with a uh, negotiated um, lease amendment and uh, the fact that that termination exists actually should provide a little incentive for the tenant to consider what the board has said here today does the existing lease have a termination for convenience clause on our behalf like most all of our others do um, I'm going to say I am uncertain. I do not think so because um, we will probably would have exercised it had it existed. Yeah, the lease provides we can terminate for cause. Well, and, the, and would would cause be not building a tower? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. So the May thirtieth termination is is generated by a letter from the tenant yes. and 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 concurrently the tenant has offered a alternative negotiated lease uh, for lesser rate and more space essentially yes um, staff is has some alternatives to that and um, if the board were to direct us to negotiate that we would um, work on the tenant um, and try to achieve the board's goals, including um, crunching down the schedule uh, for the tower construction uh, with some uh, incentives, carrot or stick, whatever, whatever is the appropriate, appropriate thing uh, to try to achieve it a little bit quicker. So if we, of, of the two choices, if we take number one, we go back out to bid and we determine what the real market is and allow the lease to expire per the termination letter that we've already received. Um, are you asking me how long it would take for that alternative? Yes. To the second. <laughs> um, I, would, I would tell you it will take us at least six months to get through the bidding process. Uh, then once they bid, they have to come up with a design. They have to get their SDP in place. Then they have to construct it, uh, the construction timeline. Uh, let's say that's 12 months. Um, you are talking two and a half or three years in my estimation. Alternative two um, costs yeah. us about 30,000 a year. We have a compelling uh, we have a compelling lang we have compelling language in that alternative two that uh, compels them to build a tower within, 18 months or or so 24 months with an incentive to get it done within 18 months with the incentive it was 18 months from essentially being ready to go lease in place that was with the incentive the outside would be uh, 24 months and uh, given the board's direction we probably would try to crunch down that 18 months a little tighter um, to try to achieve those goals well I in, initially, I was I was I was in more in line with going with option one and going out to market, but my greater concern is our community and the dire need for to the minute <laughs> as to when we're going to have a tower. We, we the, the we're, we're we we're past due. Um, I'm I'm certainly want I want to derive as much revenue as we can for the county's assets with regard to the utilization of those assets but it in in, in all sincerity if if we can have a tower there in less than two years less than th certainly less than three years if we throw this to the wolves and let 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 the let the market determine it which could take up the three years uh, I, I would be more inclined to go with uh, Option two. 
Understood. Mr. Brunecki, I have a question for you. So you're Mr. Crown Castle this morning. You're on the spot. Yes, sir. <clears throat> if we come back to you with what you've proposed to us, and instead of $2,500, we come back at market rate, just for an arbitrary figure, 4100 bucks. Is that a deal killer for you? I believe it would be. Okay. So if we come back to you uh, with a squeeze on the time, instead of 18 months down the road, you beginning, and we say we'd like to see you begin before this time next year, would that be a deal killer? I think we would begin essentially as soon as we could. As soon as we had an amended and restated lease agreement, we would begin the due diligence process, including surveying, all the stuff that goes into the construction of a tower pretty much immediately. Uh, necessary to get the zoning approvals and everything to be able to proceed to construction. Okay. So if we go to market and we find out what the market rate is and it's higher than 2500 then you're saying that that would, uh, that would kill your deal. You wouldn't be willing to talk about that. No, sir. I'm not saying that. I, I, I will say that 4100 would. I just said that. Yeah. Just um, and we did, you know, we did. An amount higher than 2500 I don't. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it would. We would have to take it back for consideration. Uh, staff did propose an increase, and we met somewhere in the middle. Um, and so we, we were proposing, as shown, the 2500 and then staff proposed a different amount, and I believe we met in the middle at 3000 uh, with a slight change to the escalator. And so that is a slight improvement, and I believe that's shown in the agenda uh, of 3000 But okay. please correct me if I'm wrong. Great. Those are uh, Commissioner Kowal. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to try to put my opinion on what I think is happening here. Maybe just to clarify some of my members on the board. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for companies to acquire properties and pay a lot of money for it for future future sites or future endeavors to build on or at some point because then it secures them locations that may be sought after by other people. I don't know how long A and T and T owned it. That was had a lease with us for this property, but evidently they didn't build a tower either. At some point, Crown back in 2013 acquired this property, signed a lease with us, and what I think is going on here is Crown is now ready to build a tower. And I think going into the process, they're looking at six thousand three hundred or five hundred and thirty dollars a month is above market rate even though they were paying it to secure the property in the future to build a tower and not let anybody else have that opportunity other than Crown, that now they put this notice in. We didn't put the notice in. They could sit back and just keep paying their $6,500 all the way to 2041. We, we have no say in that. And they still wouldn't build a tower. I think their initiative is now they want to build a tower. And the money they paid over in abundance to keep this property for that opportunity someday to build the tower like where we're at now is why they're coming back to renegotiate with and put the letter in with the intent to renegotiate and maybe bring that number down to a more market price, not 6500 I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what's kind of taking place here. And if we do go with with the count staff and, and, and Mr. the Crown organization has been negotiating, you know, they're talking 3000 but that only kicks in once the tower is complete, correct? So they're still going to pay 6500 over the next two, possibly two years, that or 18 months to completion. That, that would be staff's intent um, to provide a, um, an incentive for them to complete that. Uh, and then if it is completed on time, we would then credit them the um, uh, rent above and beyond the negotiated amount, credit that back over time so they would get the benefit of that. Um, and, and if I may, um, there's no zoning required on this property. Rather, uh, a site development plan and a building permit uh, is all that's required. So That even expedite the process even uh, it, it should expedite. And um, as I was reminded, this is not a, a, a building or a construction that we we inspect, but rather it's done through uh, through providers. It's outside of the building well, code. I think that, you know, if somehow we can test the market with established towers and with people pay in a similar size tower with similar customers on it and maybe roll this down the road before the May 30th date and say, all right, maybe we are close, $3,100, $3,200. Maybe this is a deal that could work. We end up getting a tower within 18 months and not waiting three years, put it out to bid and take the chance that we don't get anybody that's a better deal. You know, there's always that chance. 
So I, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with us doing a little bit more leg work and see what the market is out there for an established tower with rental. I don't even know, what do, what do other people pay us? Uh, in the uh, approximately 40, 38, 40, $40,000 a year. I don't know the ground, uh, the ground acreage or the ground uh, area that each tower uses, but um, that's, my memory tells me that's about the range that we're in. Uh, and there's another uh, one, I think, at about 65,000. So we're talking 36,000 annually at um, 3,000 mark. At 3,000, and that would, that would be our bare minimum uh, that we would enter into this lease. And, and um, whether or not we go out to 2071 would be something that um, we would also attempt to negotiate. Uh, we'd look at our other leases and make sure that's consistent with that and try to do a little market analysis. And um, uh, the, this company needs the time to recover its, its equity in the site. Um, I don't know whether it's two, 2071 or lesser amount. Yeah, I'm, so I, I, I guess where I'm going is I don't have a problem with us doing a little bit more legwork on our side, and but in the end of the day, this might be our best option before May 30th to come to some sort of agreement with Crown and, and get another lease. But I'll leave it up to my fellow colleagues up here and how they feel. But. Commissioner Saunders. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Klatskow, is there a, uh, a, a, an ability to assign this lease? Or could you take a look at, the, uh, typically there would be a, a, a right to assign with which uh, perhaps with the approval of the county without, and that approval would not be unreasonably withheld. I'm just curious if there's an assignment provision in there. It's there not really relevant too much, but just a curiosity. There is an assignment provision, yes. And w what does it provide? Uh, they may sign a lease, they give us notice, and um, does not, it does not say that we've got the right to say no. So they could freely assign the lease, and I'm not suggesting that there's anything nefarious or anything, but if they've got somebody else that may want to pay $6,000 a month for a lease, they could assign this lease to somebody else. Except that they've terminated it. No, I understand. If, I'm saying if we if we uh, don't if they if they re, uh, eliminate their um, their termination and we start going and we go forward with this lease amendment where it's twenty five hundred dollars a month and we extend the term theoretically they could subly or they could assign this at a higher rate. That's just a th theoretically. I'm not saying anybody would do that, but yes. Okay. So, but anyway, my issue. I don't care if, if these folks build a tower or somebody else builds a tower. My issue was making sure that we're charging a rental rate that is reasonable uh, without consideration of the, of the 600 and some odd thousand dollars that's been paid in the past. That's a, that was a business decision that was made that may not have been the, the best one, but that's in the past. If staff can come back with some um, information concerning what the rental rate should be, and you've given us other towers right now. I think you said one of our towers are paying $60,000 a year. Uh, and you mentioned a, a couple different numbers that are substantially higher than what this number would be. Uh, then the, the 36, um, yes, I believe there are some that are higher than that. Um, in, in the event the board directs us to bring this back, we would strive to do so uh, before May 30th, um, and we would provide all that information. We would use it in negotiating. Um, with the tenant and we would provide that information to the board when we bring that back before the board. My issue then is, again is just to make sure that we're getting the right amount of rent going forward. Whether it's $36,000 a year or $46,000 a year, that's, that's important to me. And uh, if, if, if it turns out that this is the right fair market rental and we raise the, the height of the tower and the square footage of the area, that's fine and we could uh, amend the lease and go forward with that but I need to know what the the rental rate should be very good Mr. LeCastro nobody's looking to prematurely end this lease so if the lease goes until uh, May 31st you got five weeks to sit down with Crown and if Crown really wants to keep this lease negotiate aggressively and come back to us with something smart um, and that includes doing a fair market value assessment and if they're not amenable to paying more because that's what they're market will bear then on the first of june 
we don't have Crown anymore and we put it out for bid. I hope that doesn't happen. Like you say, we have somebody here. We're, we're, we're halfway there. We're maybe not looking to start from scratch. But I can tell you, nobody's put a shovel in the ground and built this tower for years. So we are sort of start, starting from scratch. But knowing we have until the 31st, you know, crown balls in your court. If you don't want to, you don't want this lease to expire and, and lose the opportunity to have that piece of property and build a tower, then do everything humanly possible to work with our staff and then come back here and, and let us know, are we going to extend this lease? Um, maybe with different terms that everybody's agreeable to. Um, or if not, like you said, you know, there's a possibility you would say no. Okay, well, then we would know that as well. But knowing that the lease goes until May May 31st, then nobody here, is, I don't think, is looking to end it today. What I would say is you've summed up the best, Mr. Finn. Let's sharpen our pencils, go back to the drawing board, and then come to us and see if this is a lease that we want to continue to support or we want to watch it expire and see what's out there on the market. But that might mean that there's going to be some renegotiation with them as more information comes in on the value and can they really build it in 18 months and, you know, that. You know, Commissioner Cole said at our last meeting, and I won't say what the topic was, but he made the comment, I'm not sure we have the right team, right, um, and, uh, you know, on this one particular project. And sometimes, you know, you sit here and go, the lease is good, the money might be off by a few hundred dollars or this or that, but in the end, you sit here and go, can these guys actually do it? Um, or is there are there five other companies out there that are salivating to take to get take this lease over on June first, or at least um, negotiate with us at a higher rate, at a more proven um, have have a more proven concept to build something quickly, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know the answer to that, but I would say is. I would support giving them until the, the last day of their lease and hopefully sooner to negotiate something that we think um, it makes it smart for us to continue in a business deal with Crown and, and put pen to paper um, with something that has much more specificity, um, more definitive goals, and yes, maybe even a, a, a much more um, uh, market rate competitive price than, uh, than what is currently on there. That's what I would support. So I don't think it's um it's it's making a decision to end the lease now. It's to come back to us just like you said before this lease expires and see do we want it to expire or do we want to amend it in some way and then if they're acceptable to it. If not, then we're going to have to put it out for RFP. But we don't have to do it today because the lease still has another five. What is it? Four, seven we, weeks we, left. You uh, know? Absolutely. Um, what we need today is direction on how to proceed. Um, it is clear to me that there's the board absolutely wants this tower constructed. And as you might imagine, over the last three years, when we hear about service, service difficulties in the estates, that has become uh, staff's primary focus as well. So um, notwithstanding the rent discussion, our primary focus is to attempt to provide the public, public service that this tower potentially uh, could provide. That, uh, to be candid, that, that is our primary focus. Mr. McDaniel. It needs to be our primary focus. Um, yeah, it, it, getting as much rent as is physically possible is important, but the tower it's more important. is more important, period. Uh, do we have the extra land that they're requiring or requesting to be able to accommodate the extra equipment? Is there, is there enough room there? Uh, at, we, at, be, we believe there is. At max, I'm sorry. As, I, as, we, as we kind of further engage in this, we'll make sure that we get some preliminary preliminary survey information so that we're not um, beating down a, a dead path on this one. But my sense is that we will be okay with that. Okay. Well, and, and, and so, and I think it's important for us to remember this lease is, is only expiring because we got a termination letter from them. From, from them. <laughs> Um, so this this is being generated by the by the tower company specifically. So um, I think option one is is our best path. That doesn't mean that they can't um, they can't renegotiate the the lease. Come back. We have some more data available for what is in fact fair, and then our staff come back to us before this May thirtieth date uh, of the of the existing termination letter. Um, and, and if I may, um, uh, I, I think I have the recommendation uh, pursuant to the executive summary on the board. So um, we're kind of we're going to proceed actually with the updating the ground lease terms um, with the current tenant um, and attempt to bring back to the board something that we can agree to and that staff can recommend okay. uh, to the board. That gets us um, tower quicker. Yeah, uh, effectively, we're taking a little bit of action. We're not just going to allow the letter to um, to run, if you will, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Perdecchio, you, you hear our heart. You hear what we want. We want a tower. 
Yes, but we also want to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. Absolutely. So it's not personal. It's it's personal. I completely <laughs> understand. And I, as a taxpayer, I appreciate yeah. it. So we're going to come, we want to come back very soon. Like I'd love to see us in two weeks. It's, it's just what the market rate is conversations with them, something that we're comfortable with, squeeze the timeline down a little bit so we can get a tower started. And I think you have the will of the board to get that done. Thank you. So do we just two two option two a hybrid of two. Can you pull up two? It's option two is just an, I think I think it may be on your um, update oh, okay, screen sorry. at this point. Oh, yep. Beg your pardon. Sorry about that. Enter in negotiation. <sighs> right there. Yep. Option two, update to ground lease. I'll make a motion for option two. Yeah, I'll second it. All right. So we have a motion and a second for option two. We'll come back at a later term for um, some up, up details. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Good. Thank Get you. Get it in. Thank you. See the opportunity you have here to make all your predecessors look like fools, and you're the, you're the person that made this a huge. Mr. Crown Castle, you did good. Yeah, morning. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank God they hired you two years ago. <laughs> if only they'd done it like four. Years. Absolutely. There you go. I like that answer. You tell them. <laughs> I hope that we got that on the record. I hope your boss has heard that. <laughs> Commissioners, that brings us to item 12A, formerly 16K3. This is a recommendation to approve and authorize the chair to execute a settlement agreement in the lawsuit styled Aaron Oldfield versus Collier County, now pending in the circuit court of the 20th Judicial Circuit in and for Collier County, Florida, for the sum of $130,000. This is being moved, this was moved to the regular agenda at Commissioner McDaniel's request. And with that, I'll hand it to the county attorney. And I'll hand it to the commissioner. <laughs> commissioner it's, McDaniel. Uh, it's been handed off to me. I, 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 I'm going to make a motion, by the way. I'm going to make a motion for approval of this because, because uh, when I was reading this agenda item and I wanted to bring this up and have a discussion with our, with our risk folks, should we, should we give consideration to some uh, additional insurance for our automotive utilization by our staff? I know our, I know um, times are different now. Circumstances are different. The community is different. People are traveling. People are uh, some of the, some of the benefits of employment come with the utilization of a government vehicle, um, and given the litigious society within which we operate, um, I, I, I know that there are statutory limits for. Um, for exposure of 200,000 and this settlement is certainly within that boundary. But um, I, the, the question is, are we at the, are we at the time, time frame when we should be uh, exploring additional insurance over and above the statutory limitation? Commissioner McDaniels, commissioners, um, Michael Quigley, uh, director of risk management for the record. Um, sir, this is something that we do uh, annually upon renewal. Uh, we're constantly checking uh, different forms of insurance uh, with regards to deductibles and self-insurance. Uh, it all basically comes down to the premium dollars savings that the county um, enjoys. Um, a lot of the times, too, what we are um, subject to is the capacity that the insurance carriers are willing to offer us. And uh, in this case, because of the size of Collier County, they may only offer us a $300,000 uh, self-insured retention. So in this case, we're, we're really in the best spot because we do enjoy the savings of premium dollars. I, I, I understand we're enjoying the savings of pre pre premium dollars, but my, my question is, uh, is it, or do, or do you only look at the premium dollar exposure in relationship to the insurance uh, coverage that comes with it only at renewal? Um, I, I wouldn't say that we just uh, wait upon renewal. Uh, this is a constant uh, annual. I mean, we're, we're constantly looking at what our potentials are. Um, when you're, you're talking premium dollars versus insurance, we're always looking at what is out there uh, and for the best benefit of the county. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at uh, the savings in premium dollars certainly outweighs any cost uh, that we're paying in this particular claim. This is an unusual amount 
that we are paying at this particular time. Uh, normally, our cash dollars and claim payments are, are far less. I understand. And, and I guess my, maybe I'm not being clear with my question. And it, it, the statutory limit is 200000 The original request, the original uh, statement of exposure was far and relatively speaking far in excess of the 130 settlement that's in fact been re reached um it, do you have an estimate as to what the premium expense would be for the county um I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out actually your your question um the premium expense as far as we don't have we're, we're self-insured yes sir we have no premium expense correct do you know what that premium expense would be if we had one? Um, I, I know we're saving, you know, uh, in excess of millions uh, annually. Uh, I can't give you an exact right now. I can certainly uh, research it and get that for you. Yeah, I won't. I won't belabor the point anymore. I'll make a motion for approval and then I'll speak with you offline. Okay. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Kowal. Thank you, Chair. I um, I didn't think a whole lot about this till Commissioner McDaniel pulled it and I started taking a deeper dive into it. Uh, but I didn't see enough supporting evidence leading up to where we came with the $130,000 $130, um, number. Just knowing from my former life, I know that Florida is a no-fault state and that by statute, their own insurance should pay for their medical bills. And I said it was a reference to medical bills, to cover medical bills. And in, by statute, I think the word serious has to come in play. Do we know? I didn't see any action reports. I didn't see anything in the, you know, supporting documents. That was, was there a serious injury sustained from this accident? I'll let um, Ron. <clears throat> uh, Ron Tomasco, Assistant County Attorney. To answer your question, Commissioner Colwall, in this instance, the gentleman did have a serious bodily injury. It was a rear end collision at a traffic signal, and he did have surgery to his neck as a result of the accident. Unfortunately, he was uninsured, so that's why the numbers were so particularly high. In this case, he had no form of insurance, so the providers were able to basically bill the sticker price, if you will, for the uh, care that he received as a result of the surgery. That, well, that makes sense. The yeah. no-fault yeah. statute wouldn't have kicked in because yeah. he was uninsured. He was uninsured. All right. I'll second the motion. All in favor to approve, say aye. 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 All opposed? Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Commissioners, that brings us to item 15, staff and commission general communications. Item 15A is public comments on general topics, not on the current or future agenda, by individuals not already heard during previous public comments in this meeting. We have none. Thank you. Uh, we're to item 15B, staff project updates. First up, we have an update on our donated air purifiers. Allegedly. Or not. Okay. Well, let's shuffle the deck and figure out where our update is on that. And we will have item 15B2 is a cybersecurity update, please. Mr. Gillis, uh, your IT director. Thank you. Uh, Mark Gillis, Divisional Director of Information Technology. I'm here to give you a briefing on our cybersecurity uh, apparatus and status. Uh, cybersecurity is a strategic priority for the county, and you're going to see that in the budget process as we go forward uh, through May. Um, mainly because of the uh, cybersecurity environment of malware and ransomware out there right now, uh, it's a super important one. Uh, Florida right now is ground zero for attacks in the United States. Um, so we have to stay vigilant, and to make it worse, it's illegal in the state of Florida for any government entity to pay ransomware to actually get your data back. So uh, we have to be ready to be able to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover from when we get hit. And we will get hit. We get attacked 1,000 times a year. Uh, so um, can't really be specific during this uh, briefing, but I'll be as generalized as possible to let you know that we're covered, okay, and keep the citizens safe. So what are we doing? We take the layer effect uh, where we provide 
lots of different layers of, um, of security, and you're going to see the, the slide up here, which I like to use as the blockchain. Uh, we have at least one layer in each of these areas to block uh, cyber attacks. Uh, we partner with top of the industry solutions, whether that be hardware, software, uh, both in the cloud and on premise. Um, things we've done over the last year and a half since I've been here is we've made major upgrades to our backup capacity. Most of the backup systems uh, of, of the viruses these days uh, can sit in your environment for six months. So previously, we only had about 30 days of backup. So we have now uh, put the hole, the hole in that, uh, that issue, and now we have over six months. The other thing that is very important is when you get attacked, the first thing to do is attack your backups so that you can't get restored. We put in a mutable backup system and upgraded the software there. In addition to that, uh, we take backups during the day in the, uh, uh, through snapshots, and those are also immutable. So we should be set pretty well for, uh, for backup and recovery. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've upgraded our SAN system to um, put software in place that will not allow horizontal attacks. So we've segmented off our SAN system. So that will, uh, will help that way. We've also made major uh, changes to the segmentation of our network so that viruses and malware can't uh, go across different types of network apparatuses. Um, the other thing, uh, we've updated our password policy. Very unpopular in the county, but very necessary. Um, we now have software that we continuously, continuously scan uh, not only our hardware, our software, to make sure that if any new vulnerabilities are found, we can actually then get those uh, patched as soon as possible. Uh, we have a team in the cybersecurity uh, uh, department here that actually takes care of that, and we do that like every day, every minute we're patching stuff. Um, we've added some incident recovery capabilities. We've added multi-factor authentication in areas, and we'll be expanding that. Um, we've upgraded our edge routers uh, so that they can stop the more complex attacks and put in virtual firewalls. We attend uh, FLGSA conferences uh, to help, and, and we get briefings based on what's, what's happening out there uh, with malware and with uh, ransomware. And we also receive briefings from Homeland Security, FBI, our risk management uh, division. And um, thanks to the state uh, FLDS grant, we've gotten about $300 worth of uh, software and apparatus we've added over the last year. And we are right now in that prog process of renewing that grant. Um, $300 or $300,000? $300,000, I'm sorry. Um, so in addition to that, we formalized a training program throughout the county uh, for cybersecurity training. It's extremely important. You know, we can do all we can on the hardware and software side, but really the human being is the weak link. So uh, we formalized the whole training process. And actually, since we've actually formalized that, the state of Florida has also made it mandatory. Um, so our program has been certified so that it covers that. In addition to that, uh, anybody who has elevated privileges, they have an extended training that they have to do monthly. It is. Um, like to recognize our, our very uh, talented cybersecurity team. Uh, William Buza leads that uh, team. He's our cybersecurity manager. Eduardo Ruiz, Dennis Linguidi, Elsa Riza, and Forrest Abbott. Uh, and I also want to give credit to the previous cybersecurity manager, uh, Augusto um, Vega. He uh, was very instrumental in getting us that, helping us get that grant. Uh, going forward, what we need to do is we need to continuous, continuously um, educate our cybersecurity staff, uh, make sure they get the certifications they need. We're continually sending them to uh, conferences to make sure that they're kept up to date on the latest uh, attack vectors. 
Um, we also need to finish the security operations center room that we're putting up on the sixth floor here. Um, and then also uh, we've been working with the county manager's office and the county attorney's office about redacting information uh, about the hardware and software that we have been purchasing to make sure that uh, that information is redacted from the public records request so that people outside the county don't know exactly what kind of software we have uh, so that if a vulnerability is announced that they don't know that we have it and that gives us a chance to patch it. So I'd like to thank the board, county manager's office for all the support um, that they've given us in being able to keep the county data safe. I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, Commissioner Saunders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I asked that we have this update. Uh, obviously, we're getting into our budget process here very quickly, and I just want to make sure that you have the resources that you need to make sure that we're doing everything we can do to protect our systems. And so that's my, my question to you is, uh, I know you're preparing budgets now. Uh, um, I think this is an area where everyone would agree we, we have to spend whatever it takes to protect those systems. And so that's, that's my question. I'm, I'm assuming that, you, that your budget request and everything will take care of, of everything that you need. Yes, the, our IT budget was done back in January, February timeframe, so that way there we can get it to everybody else so they'll know how much we need. Uh, so it's definitely a strategic priority. You're going to, like I said, you're going to see that in the slides as we go forward. I think the board has done an outstanding job uh, helping support financially what we need to get done, and that's accounted for in the, uh, in the IT budget that we submitted. Thank you. Mr. LeCastro. Um, Mark, I guess I'm what you call a heavy email user, and you know that you since you and I talk a lot. Um, I'm not a fan of changing my password every 18 hours and having it include 28 characters, six symbols, um, four shapes, and two animals um, in, my, uh, in my list, but I'll just go on the record and say that. In all seriousness, I do want to give you a, a, and your team a, a positive shout-out. Um, you know, when it's 7 a.m. on a Sunday and I'm trying to do emails and answer constituent, you know, issues or problems or whatnot, and I have had something, I really don't care what time it is. I want to be able to call your, your emergency number and get help immediately because it might be a, a crazy hour, you know, in the real world, but it's not to commissioners, you know, when we're trying to get stuff done and things. I always get an instantaneous response. And as you've said before, you know, usually I send you a note and just say, just so you know, I'm having a problem, but your guys are on it. You always call me back, and almost 100% of the time, you're like, Commissioner, don't do anything. I got this. And then, you, you know, this just happened, you know, recently. And then what? In, in minutes, you said, we found the problem. We reset it. Try it now. And it worked perfectly. So, you know, I know that's the job that you have and the folks that are at, on the emergency number. That's what they're supposed to do. But I can tell you, I've, like all of us, I've used email and all kinds of business and prior in the military, and sometimes you call that 800 number, you get a voicemail and you wait seven hours and you, and you hear back from nobody. You guys are very responsive and, you know, it's not an exact science. The gremlins sometimes, I mean, how many times have you and I traded a text and you're like, I don't know why it didn't work 30 seconds ago. Let me try something and then it works. But having that response and that sense of urgency is something that I think we all appreciate. So, um, you know, like Commissioner Saunders is saying, we want you to have the resources that you have when it comes to financials. But I think the most important resource you have is good people who know that, you know, we, we appreciate a sense of urgency and, you know, we want to be able to be responsive, um, whether we're sending, an, we're sending an email to Tallahassee or to a constituent that has a pothole that they're upset about and we need your system to do it. And when it doesn't do it, we need to be able to get back online. Um, I know I, in particular, I, I've been in a previous job where I had a window of time to knock out a whole bunch of stuff. But because IT was down and I couldn't get a hold of anyone, that window evaporated. And so it didn't make the most efficient use of my day. I have not had that here at the county. I've had plenty of frustrations. But, um, you know, you and your team really do a great job in record time um, getting back with us. And I, I would hope the rest of the county staff um, has that same, um, uh, gets that same type of service because I know I'm, I personally sure have. 
So, um, and thanks for all the um, password changes, you know, on a regular, no, there's a need for that. We get it. We, you know, the, the thing is, we're not used to that here. So you're, you're bringing us up to a standard that exists in, in other places. And that's, that's why we've got a little bit of frustration. We're used to, you know, having people have their password be one, two, three, four dog. And it's that way for 17 years, you know, so realistically, I won't applaud you for getting us up to that standard because it, it's frustrating. But, um, you know, you're you and your team are identifying a lot of things that are uh, that are um, raising that bar where we need to be. But um, but thanks for your quick response, especially at those sort of unopportune times and, and crazy hours. It's been much appreciated, and I just wanted you to know that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I was lucky when I came to the county. We have a very talented and dedicated staff here in IT. Um, I think that you'll notice since I've been here, uh, my emphasis on excellent customer service, because I believe IT is a customer service division. And uh, I'm hoping that what you see is everybody in the county is seeing, and I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that it is. I know we fall short at times, but we are getting there. And uh, appreciate your uh, recognition. I also wanted to recognize uh, our cybersecurity team works really hand in hand with their NetOps team and uh, our hosting team. And they deserve a lot of credit because they, they really have gelled together and working hand in hand to make sure that all the stuff in my vision of cybersecurity here at the county uh, really uh, takes, takes place in the, in the manner that I think that we, it needs to. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Yes, well, and I also want to thank you, Mark, um, and applaud uh, all your efforts that you've done um, to, to help protect us. I think it's important for us to remember we're a great big company, and there are thousands of users of, of our IT that need it every single day. And um, with your direction and um, implementation of these protections, um, it, it, it's, it's, it goes, it, it's, it's astounding. It's, it's really astounding. My, my question is, and, and you know, Commissioner Castro mentioned the, the password. I was probably your biggest arguer when it came time to be changing my password. Um, have we looked into the AI programming for the manipulation of the passwords that are utilized? I, I know when I sign on to my um, bank account and put in the password that I have had for a year plus, um, AI cranks out another addition to my um, typed in password. Uh, have, have we looked into that technology as far as having to manipulate our own individual passwords? I think the AI that you're talking about, we really haven't looked into mainly because uh, I think that you know, what we instituted on the password change policy is, is NIST compliant. It's, uh, it's a standard that's been raised since, you know, over the last two or three years. Uh, and I think that we're probably fine there. The more important thing, what you're talking about, I think, is multi-factor authentication, uh, which gives us the second nod. And, and we're looking at right now where, like, I'm sorry, I can't go into specifics what we're looking at right now, but we are instituting some changes that will help with that, that second uh, authentication point. Uh, some of it will make it a little more convenient, some of it maybe not so more convenient, depending on where you're at, uh, but uh, it will allow, um, uh, there's just some changes coming there. Okay, I just, like I said, my, I noticed when I, when I sign on to my bank account and, and hit enter to go in, there, there's a blip on my screen past my password that, that, that I'm assuming their AI, their security is adding to my password to, to further protect my efforts mm -hmm. in my in my bank account, and and I thought that might be if. Yeah, might I, be I believe that to be extra multi-factor authentication that they've added. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, you know, like your credit card, you have the, the strip on the back that's actually added on to part of your credit card number. That's what they're doing with the multi-factor authentication okay. portion of that. Mr. Kowal. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'd like to also thank you, Mark, for the hard work you guys do. And, uh, and I'm used to changing my password coming from the Sheriff's Department. Mm -hmm. I still don't like it. So, I, you know, I did it for 20 years there, and now I'm doing it here again. I thought I was getting away from it, but I guess not. Um, 
A lot of people don't realize how much more work you guys do outside of just the IT and our security and stuff like that. You got, I mean, we got the pickleball tournament. I know you guys are highly involved in a lot of the telecommunications with that, uh, the stuff you guys do out at the sports park. So you guys do a lot of different things, a lot of different for the county that you know may not be seen behind the scenes. But uh, you know, you do a great job at it, and I just want to thank you guys for doing that. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, we we run the whole uh, network apparatus so that. People like CBS Sports can run their broadcast over our network so that it can get out there, which is a huge benefit to the county. Um, the other thing that people don't realize is that uh, in Paradise Coast, we, we've wired every single one of those fields out there so that they can stream video from there. Now, the people who came and video did the video service for American Youth Football uh, back in December, they said we are the only facility in the United States that will do that. And uh, uh, so, so really proud of that. That's something, you know, we've done in the last year, year and a half since I've been here. Uh, but ag again, I have a very talented team that helps, helps me look good, helps the rest of the IT team look good. So uh, really appreciate them. So it's not really you. <laughs> it's, no, it's no, sir, it absolutely is not. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mark. You know, you said the, the human factor is the weakest link. Please, Jesus, if you go to 16 characters, I'm doomed. <laughs> it's funny because there's a commissioner on the board that was complaining about going to 14 characters, and uh, they were already at 13, I think. <laughs> so the extra character yeah. made a difference. But it, it is important. So we appreciate all your support. We really do. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Uh, Let's uh, st go back to item 15B1, which is the update on the donated air purifiers. Now we have our, our folks in the room. Mr. Summers. Commissioners, for the record, Dan Summers, Director of Emergency Management. I'm sorry, I was upstairs engrossed in FEMA policy, so uh, just sorry couldn't. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was an exciting read. Uh, real quick, just want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to let emergency management participate in the donated air cleaners. Um, honestly, that is a terrific opportunity for us to, number one, put a few of those in the evacuation shelters and make these available uh, to other nonprofit agencies, and we're soliciting them. Um, we're going through that solicitation right now. Um, we are happy to help facilitate our NGOs, maybe even deliver them to them uh, so that uh, things like the uh, nonprofit daycares would have an opportunity to have some additional uh, air purification in their areas uh, for a healthy environment. So we are happy to do it. It is easy to do within our skill set. And uh, I believe we have some paperwork. We just have to address some dollar, vo uh, dollar value on the equipment and uh, with your blessing, we'll go ahead and proceed and help execute and get those items out in the community. Mr. Saunders. I, thank you, I appreciate that. I, uh, in terms of any additional information that you may need in terms of value, if you'll let me know what you need, I can. I've, uh, yeah, I think there's just one line on the form we need to put a value on and uh, Josh, Josh Starrett on our team who works with our nonprofit agencies We'll handle that solicitation and uh, we'll support them on the logistics. And we have no restrictions on where these go. So, okay. Uh, if you can kind of report back to us, we will you know, where, give where us a look. Going. Yeah, we'll, we'll solicit and see the interest. Uh, we'll double check. Our team will work with facilities, double, double check on that inventory, uh, make sure everything's ready to go. And we'll, as soon as we make some uh, progress, we'll report back. Okay. And uh, obviously, uh, the health department. Yes, well, all, all of those players where that environment uh, engages. We had, we had a couple of those that we had acquired during COVID, um, and, but there are other areas we can augment that equipment How with. How many units did, did we ultimately want? I want to say it was close to 70 some. Yeah, 80, 80, 80 units. And so uh, again, we'll, we, we have just started soliciting those partner agencies for that opportunity. And uh, I think it's a great uh, opportunity for Collier County to support the NGOs and other uh, health organizations, and we'll we'll happy to, to do that as a gesture. And then when when these are finally distributed, I do want to get back to the donor and let them know that we we will were able to. we'll be glad to put a summary of those activities and and where they went and put that together so that the uh, donating party can close the loop. Thank you. 
My pleasure. Thank you. Commissioners, one last update. Mr. Mullins is going to come up and give you an update on our new or our potential new county logo. For the record, John Mullins, your Director of Communications, Government and Public Affairs, and hoping to end the day here on a positive note. Let's try to keep it positive. So we're talking about a potential logo refresh. Now on May 8th, Collier County is going to turn 101 and it may be time to reevaluate our outdated branding. Now a refresh could modernize our image uh, while maintaining our core identity and it can also help to reflect uh, the impact of new ideas and a change in direction. Also keep in mind that most businesses refresh their brand every seven to 10 years. Now, of course, we have to be mindful that our funding comes from the taxpayers. So where we might want to refresh our brand of the last 25 years, we also have to roll it out in a responsible and even cost neutral way. And a few of our county divisions have also been uh, considering refreshing their old logos, and it would be better to provide an overarching agency wide brand first to allow for complementary aesthetics to be incorporated into their variations. Now with that in mind, we took the potential for a logo refresh to our residents via our 6,000 external newsletter subscribers and on our social media platforms. And we were careful to point out two important facts. One, any implementation of a new logo would be rolled out in a cost neutral approach. Applying the new logo to county equipment and items as they're ordered or replaced. And two, we would not be proposing to change the official seal of Collier County, the wild turkey. The turkey has been the official county seal since uh, being first adopted by the BCC at their very first meeting in July of 1923. And the version that's still applied to our official documents today was designed in now, 1960. Now just so you know, I, I voted against that. <laughs> <laughs> So the pencil sketch was provided by Commissioner Saunders uh, in 1960, and Margaret Scott, the Kirk, uh, clerk of the courts, perfected it. Uh, the turkey is undefeated in previous attempts to refresh or replace. Uh, the first suggestion to do so was in 1981 and was tamped down quickly, and an actual turkey coup attempt in 1984 received a lot of press. So pardon the expression, we didn't want to bite off more than we can chew with the turkey, so it's tanned, rested, and ready for another 100 years if needed. But for our staff-created logo with its hard to accurately reproduce gradient sun and its green fronds that almost look like something you would get at a local dispensary, maybe it's time to give it a well-deserved sunset. So previously, I sat down with the chair to gauge his desire to bring this change forward, and this is what he had to say. And I love the fact that we're doing it different. I love that. Just because the way we've always done it doesn't make it right or doesn't make it effective. I remember I'm good that. with change. Did so you say that? Thanks for that. <laughs> All right, to be fair, that had absolutely nothing to do with the logo, but our meeting was of a similar sentiment, or I would not be standing here before you today. Now, as mentioned, we put out some options to the public for their input via a logo refresh survey, and we used them as sort of a giant focus group to give us a base to work from. And as he did with the creation of our centennial emblem, our talented graphic designer uh, and webmaster, Santiago Arenas, who's right behind me, came up with some creative, diverse variations for the public to consider, along with an option to retain our current county logo. We received uh, 3,300 votes, Wow. 2,200 of those, two-thirds, voted for a change. Out of 6,000? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's now, some of that was social media as well, but yeah, two-thirds voted for a change in our branding. And the change leader and runner-up are what's on your screen right now. Now, there were also three other options in addition to our county, uh, current county logo that they looked at. But we didn't stop there. We also listened to the feedback that we received uh, in conjunction with the survey, and we incorporated those into our front runner with tweaks for a final design. Uh, so Santiago did what you have in front of you now. This is the actual proposal. Now, this also comes in a single color design, which is much more uh, easy to replicate than what we currently have. 
And this would be the white version, which you might see on glass or on a darker background. So, what say you? With your consent, we could have this ready to be rolled out as soon as our 101st birthday or on July 1, but given the fact that this is going to be done gradually as items are taken out of circulation or replaced, there really is you know, a flexible start date. I mean, so we can do this anytime that you're ready. And of course, with that, I also want to thank Santiago, who came up with these designs uh, after he and his wife welcomed their first child. So he did it with half the amount of sleep that he's normally accustomed to, uh, and he does excellent work. And if you have any questions about uh, his choices in the design, he's here to answer those questions as well. Otherwise, we defer to you and your expertise. Commissioner Castro. So, John, what you were saying is it would be sort of like, you know, cost, the cost would be minimal because you'd phase it in over time. It's not like you need, you're asking for $200,000 to do this. Um, so I heard that part. I'm just going to play devil's advocate. I like the new design and, like you said, a little bit of a refresh. Does it bring us 10,000 more visitors? You know, does it do this? Are we doing it just to do it? But, you know, I understand marketing and, uh, you know, the ability to, you know, put a, a fresh spin on something. But we're making that argument, but then we're keeping the turkey. So, I mean, I'm kind of like, okay. Um, but I guess my real question is, if you phase it in over time, and this is just more of just a plan devil's advocate, the problem is then you have multiple logos everywhere. We have the old one, we have the new one, and we really don't gravitate towards the new one for a while. And, and then you still find old ones sort of that exist somewhere. So sometimes, and I'm not I'm not proposing this, but sometimes an automatic launch for an immediate change actually does rebrand you. I mean, think about it this way. If Coke or Pepsi or any of the giant companies said, we want to come up with a new logo and we'll, um, we'll exhaust all the cans we have and all the new cans will rebrand, you would have two, two different brands on the shelves. They don't do that. They crush everything. They destroy everything and they start from scratch. You know, they got a little bit more money than us. And sometimes, you know, that's not the most cost effective way, but a rebrand is really a relaunch and it's not sort of a phase in. So what are your thoughts on that? And this is me just talking out loud, you know, just yeah. to get the conversation going. I don't think we want to spend three hours, you know, talking about this. I like the new logo. So, um, you know, hats off to the work that, you know, you did giving it sort of a, a fresh look. I don't know that it makes us a better county or anything, but you know, there is some, some positives into giving, giving everything a little bit of a facelift over time, but, you know, I'll end it by saying, then why, why don't we get rid of the turkey? Um, but anyway, like you said, more of, that's more of a historical thing. But what's your thought on what I just said about, are we re really rebranding if we're phasing it in over a slow period of time? And we're doing that to be cost effective. You know, we're waiting for all the stationery to run out before we use the new one, but then now you got multiple you know, logos out there. Well, it is a brand refresh. I agree 100% with what you're saying uh, in regard to a rollout. I mean, optimally, and if money was not an issue, we would do this all at once. We would go down, we'd take out all the signs, we'd replace all of the, the stationery, every branded t-shirt or polo that gets worn by uh, our staff, all of that would be changed. Uh, but because we are a local government and because we do have to be spend thrifty and we have to be mindful of the taxpayers' investment, uh, the smartest approach we felt was to just do a gradual rollout. Yes, there will be overlap uh, of the existing logo with the current logo. Uh, and keep in mind, this is a refresh. It's not really a replacement or a complete rebranding. It is a refreshment of our current logo. So it's kind of taking what we've had for the last 25 years and starting our next 100 years saying, okay, this is who we are now. This is the direction we're going. I'll just follow it up where, by saying there is actually a cost because, like you said, we're buying no, new polos. If this logo is sitting on our, on our bus stop shelters or it's somewhere in the county, at some point those stickers, those decals, those whatever need to be you know, taken off so we can, we can more quickly graduate to its new logo. And if we didn't pick the new logo, then those things would, would, would stay in place unless they're totally faded or whatever. So, I mean, I'm just sitting here saying the best use of taxpayer dollars. I don't know what my colleagues think, but I thought I would just push my button and get the discussion started so we can make a command decision. Yeah. And also, I would, uh, to your comment about the turkey, it's not that we wouldn't like to shoot it. We probably would. Now, I'm going to get a lot of flack for just saying that. But uh, at one point, there was a suggestion that we retool the centennial emblem into a new county seal. 
uh, because it represents a little bit more of a diverse history of Collier County beyond just, you know, its primary food source when they got here. Now, the turkey is still in, uh, incorporated in that centennial seal, so it wouldn't be getting rid of the turkey. It would just be adding other aspects of our history to it. But once again, we're not trying to start a civil war here. We're just trying to refresh our brand. So we're going down the uh, rabbit hole we think we can actually come through the other side of successfully. Commissioner McDaniel. So the one that's on the screen right now is going to be our new logo. If you consent to it, yes. Okay. And so, and we're not going to go throw away whatever we have. I mean, and, and there again, it's this, we're not a private company. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're a government and we're going to utilize the assets that we've already expensed for. And over time, we're going to orient to this. And so the stickers aren't going to be replaced until they need to be replaced. And then we'll have this, the, the, the new logo on those. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, and and again, I'll, I'll acquiesce to, to greater minds with regard to the refreshing aspect of things. Just uh, I, I, you know, I, I've thought for a long time that the turkey needed some love and just the the picture that we have that 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 artwork's uh, not not the greatest on the planet. I'm but not going to lie, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Arenas would back me up on this. The turkey is actually very hard to reproduce. Yeah. So all that stuff, all that now was saying, uh, do you need a motion out of us to go forward with the refreshing? That would probably be acceptable, yes. And, and if it's on that premise of no, no replacement, just re redo of what we're doing as we exhaust the supplies that we have, I'll make the motion. I'll second that. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Um, was there ever any thought to underneath Collier County? I don't want to over-engineer this thing, um, but underneath Collier County in, in smaller font, put the word Florida. I mean, you know, you send, you, you know, we, we correspond with counties all over the country and we send things all over the country. And granted, the word Florida is in our mailing address or, or what have you, but I just wondered if, if part of the branding was, you know, if, if I lived in Utah and I saw this, I wouldn't know where Collier County was, but if in smaller print with the same font, it said, it said Florida, it might be more sort of like nationally recognizable. Just a thought. I mean, the palm tree tells you that it's not Montana, right. but... Um, I was just curious if yeah, there's any well, thoughts of that. We have Santiago here. I'm sure as part of this design, he started to look at what other counties do in this state and probably beyond. But I know that he had some things in the back of his mind uh, to give him direction on this particular incarnation. So let's just have Santi talk about what he discovered on that journey. Did you get any sleep last night with the baby? Or? No, I did not. Yeah, I figured Still not. Okay. Four months and going. Uh, Thank you for having me here. Um, in regards to um, adding the Florida right below it, it is a possibility and it could be an option uh, down the road. Um, going from what we have, which is Collier County, uh, right now in the current one, we do not have the state of Florida. And after looking at, after doing uh, research, looking at various different counties within this state of Florida, um, I would probably have to say the majority of them don't have the word Florida on it. And some of them do have the FL on it, but as, an, as a second option or as an optional um, item that they can actually put out to either advertising, um, public relation material, marketing materials, or um, products. We have a motion and a second to refresh. All in favor say aye. 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 And would the board have a preference as to when this rollout begins? Would you prefer it be in conjunction with our 101st birthday? Would you prefer it be July 1 or just at our leisure? Well, the eclipse has already passed, so it's <laughs> up to you. <laughs> All right. We can take that as guidance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioners, that brings us to staff and Commission General Communications. And before Mr. Mullins goes away, I have two things. Sorry, John. Um, first off, we just wanted to touch base on the ethics um, bill from last uh, from last agenda. Um, let's, let's 
just delay that okay uh, because i know uh senate president had some interest in that issue and let's, let's just put that off until we have a little further well i guess we're getting uh, john john may want to come up yeah. and just say we're kind of getting to that point in time where something's going to happen yeah. to it I don't think it has it gone to the governor yet. No, it has not. It's been enrolled since uh, March 8th, so it's been a month now uh, that it could have been in a posture to be presented to the governor. It has not at this point, which could just signal that there may be some issues they're trying to consider uh, in determining what the governor's action will be, or it could just be that there's a backlog of bills waiting to get there. Uh, I don't want to read too much into that. Well, I just hate to do do this under under the circumstances. But uh, the, the issue was th th that the Senate president did have some interest in that bill. And I wanted to have her office have an opportunity to let us know what that interest is. Why don't we do this? Why don't we continue this until uh, the next meeting? If the governor signs it between now and then, so be it. But uh, I'll talk to her office and see if, if there's any interest in, in some participation on her part. Okay. Very good. Second. Speaking of the governor, we did, some of us, uh, I think Commissioner Kowal received, and I did too, a call for action from the city of Naples regarding the $5 million appropriation for the Naples Pier being the subject to further scrutiny. The uh, city of Naples is requesting letters of support for that money to stay in, which obviously is of interest to us, but it's uh, going to be a very expensive endeavor to rebuild the pier. Um, so if it's all right with the board, we could have Mr. Mullins write up a letter of support. They provided a sample letter, which was one that was written by the city council, so we'll need some adjustment, but we can have uh, Mr. Mullins work on a letter of support for the chair's signature. Yes. Bring it. All right. Thank you very much. That's all I have. County Attorney. Nothing. Thank you. Commissioners. Mr. Kowal. I just want to say I think we did a lot of good work today and efficiently and in a, in a timely manner. So. Thank you all. Mr. Saunders. I will ditto that, and I don't have anything else to add. Mr. LeCastro. Um, I just had a couple of quick things. Um, one of the things we passed on the consent agenda, and I just wanted to make note of it, is 16F6, and it was great work by our county manager team and especially our parks and rec leadership to um, work with Tallahassee to get us a quarter of a million dollars worth of uh, money that we're going to put towards CAC Sambas. So um, in, in the newsletter that I'm about to release this week, I'll be talking a lot about, CAC, about Costco in case you're wondering, um, separating rumor from fact, um, but even more about Caxambas. Um, you know, citizens that drive by Caxambas and think we've done nothing um, couldn't be further from the truth. These, a lot of these are the same people that drove by the Winterbury tax collector's office and thought we were doing nothing, and then we opened a new office. We have a, a contractor to build the new building on the old site. We have an artist rendering, so things take time. When you lose the roof on your house, you call Allstate and a roofer shows up, you know, pretty quick. Um, when you're dealing with taxpayer dollars, it's a little bit um, more um, complicated. But thanks to our Parks and Rec team for not only getting that um, that $250,000 to add to the pot, it's the the total rebuild of Caxambas is going to be a lot more expensive than that. And, I, and I'll have details in, in my newsletter that I'm sending out in the next couple of days. Um, but uh, good work there. Um, Added to that, to Parks and Rec, and you know, Tanya, I know you're listening in the back. I recently read an, an article that talked about um, a tragedy that happened, and I forget what state it was in. It was just something that I, I just remembered, um, and it talked about how the AED at the pool at this um, location, the batteries were dead, and so I think the person actually passed. It's not in Florida. Um, and it, like I said, I just sort of read read it, you know, quickly in passing. But it made me think: we're sitting here, about to turn the corner on May, June, July. You know, the summer's coming. I know we have a checklist that has us go through every, um, you know, AD and make sure that you know the batteries aren't rusty or, or old. And so I'm not saying that we have a problem, but just as a quadruple check, let's make sure that um, we we don't have any stone unturned, you know, when it comes to AEDs because we have them everywhere but they're only good if they work. And so somebody pulling it off the wall and finding out that that was the one that was missed, you know, during the three year check or what have you. Um, so I don't know, it, obviously you're about to make a comment. I remember having a conversation saying we had a really great aggressive program to check our AED. So I, I'm not being directive that we don't do it, that, that we don't have it, but it was just more of a reminder. So um, your comment. Thank you, Commissioner. For the record, Tanya Williams, Public Services Department head. And as I walked up, uh, Mr. Finn was already on his phone 
uh, coordinating with facilities. Facilities um, regularly uh, checks and monitors our AED systems, um, so it's on a, a regular basis, it's on a regular check, but that is a good reminder. Uh, May is right around the corner, and as we start summer, summer use, so thank you, sir. And I don't say this to be sarcastic, we're all, the, we're, we're all a county team, but we have the same aggressive checks for light bulbs, yet how, how many times have I gotten an email from somebody saying, I played tennis last night and four of your seven light bulbs have been burned out for six months. Um, and that's, a, that's an actual email. And then we're like, shame on us that nobody caught it. And so AEDs are a, a life and death thing. So, um, you know, thank you. And then lastly, I just wanted to say, um, unlike Senator Saunders, or, you know, former Senator, or I say Senator Saunders, who knows Kathleen, uh, Senator Pasadoma personally and has worked, you know, closely with her. Um, I've only had a similar experience probably as the other commissioners, maybe more, more maybe less, which was just um, business. You know, I, I'm not in her social circle or anything, but even before being a commissioner and during a commissioner, I did have um, some um, interactions with um, John Pasadomo, and I just want to say, you know, he was a he was a really great man, and a lot of things that are that came to this county that were good and were big improvements that Senator Pasadomo really couldn't do because it might be a conflict of interest or it was, you know, something that maybe, um, you know, he, he really was an incredible, you know, for lack of a better term, and they've been saying in the paper, first husband. So when it came to the Naples Senior Center, you know, he was really big on that. You know, he really had a lot of clout in this county, so he was able to talk to people like the Bakers and some others that are big, big philanthropists in the, uh, in the, in the county and shake the trees. So total freak accident. I mean, the guy was in probably better shape than all of us sitting up here. And, um, you know, he'll, he'll be missed because he, um, he really added a lot to the county. And I know the, the interactions I had with them and there were business, we weren't social, um, you know, in social circles or anything, always super professional, um, you know, knew, knew his stuff, got behind causes and, you know, was, was relentless, but, but not unprofessional. And so, you know, I was I'm shocked as everybody was to see that he passed. Um, I'll just end it by telling you when I was at Physicians Regional, we had somebody that came in and they had already expired and they were a, a cyclist and they were in their um, early 70s. And, and it was a gentleman that was in one of those Speedo, you know, um, um, Olympic cycling suits, had, rode 100 miles a day and, and all of this and had had another freak accident. And he was on US 41 and sort of on a tight little, it's not even a bicycle path, but for some reason, you know, he had to be riding down 41 and uh, got off into the gravel. And I remember the paramedics telling us in the ER, he hit the one rock that was on the side of the road that if he would have been two inches north or south or east or west, you know, he would have had scratches, but it hit him right on the temple. You know, Mr. Pasadoma must have had something sort of, um, you know, once in a lifetime, you know, um, unfortunate, unique accent. But um, I just thought I would just tell a little bit of a personal story that I was always really impressed with them, even though I didn't know him on a, on a, on a personal social level. Um, you know, I, this, this county will miss his, his leadership for sure. Um, and, uh, and his efforts behind the scenes a lot of times as well. So Mr. McDaniel. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll all miss him. And uh, those were, it was, it was a good acknowledgement. He, he, he was our friend and, um, certainly a terrible loss and and other other i have nothing else to add um we're done i have nothing to add so except for mr mullins i'll have to say that we are adjourned therefore here too <laughs>